Sunday Times advertising. Of course. Nice. Of course. It makes, makes perfect sense. That'll do. Hey, everyone, and welcome to That Publish Show, viewers and comments and questions live. Dan here. Mick here. Hello. Welcome. Happy Monday, everyone. Happy Monday. Indeed. How was your weekend? It was uh, splendid and tremendous. Lovely. Yes, I mowed the lawn. I saw Rosie badgered you until you took her to the pub. Yes. Nice. Yeah. Actually, no, I was doing a bit of work yesterday. Came in here to, to edit a video, and uh, as I was waiting for it to output, the dog looked at me with eyes that just said, let's go to the pub. <laughs> yeah, she can. She does that. I was like, ah, you're such a bad influence. I didn't get a spaniel for this. I got an, a spaniel for improved health, Daniel. <laughs> I just realised Daniel rhymes with spaniel. <laughs> you, you've just realised that. I thought that's why you got a spaniel. That makes me want to get two more spaniels called Nathaniel and Emmanuel. <laughs> that's very good. Very good. This is what you come for, people. Indeed. How well, are we all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hope everyone's doing well. If you're new here, we do this every Monday. Yep. Um, you can submit questions. We prioritise super chats on YouTube. Um, if you're not new here and you're here every week or most weeks, welcome back. Thank you for being here. We Indeed. appreciate it. Indeed. Uh, so we'll start off with some news. Some big news this week. Spinal Tap 2 is coming. <laughs> we're, obviously, we're going to make cameo appearance. Um, but yeah, Spinal Tap 2, they've, they've confirmed that that's happening. So that's amazing. Yeah. Um, what else has happened? Imagine in the... what Harry Shearer's fee is going to be this, oh, these days. Oh man, yeah. Very. Have, did you see? Or, did you see about the court case? No, I didn't see about so the court case. They didn't make any money from the original Spinal Tap. Oh. And Harry Shearer just went. You know what? I'm not standing for this. And he bankrolled the whole uh, um, lawsuit himself. Um, but yeah, it's re yeah, really interesting. So, anyway. Uh, yeah, very really, really interesting guy. What's not in any way whatsoever hilarious about that is that not only is it the story of a spoof band, it's also the story of a spoof band getting ripped off in a spoof lawsuit. It's too true to be true. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so that was good. I had a guitar lesson this right. week from none other than Tim Lurch. That's a big deal. I So I got a message from Tim. There, that's him now. Um, also, um, Bev wants to double check that the podcast is recording. Thanks, Bev. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, yeah, so I'm a. I saw Tim, um, Tim Lurch, playing on YouTube years ago. And was like, oh man! I just is. I want to interrupt your Tim Lurch story, okay. which you'll pick up in a minute if that's all right. Sure. To say, BV, thank you, thank you, thank you, legend. Uh, a for moderating. Everyone say thanks to BV Ninja for moderating. B for reminding me to hit record on the podcast. Now, Train Franks normally saves us <laughs> as he rips the audio out and gives it. <laughs> Everything's fine. Hello, podcast listeners on Patreon.com. Thank you for being here. Sorry, Dan. Back yes. to Tim Lurch. See, yeah. So anyway. Let's I've, Lurch back to Lurch. Le so I I mentioned him on the show and just said how amazing he is. Um, a beautiful jazz guitar player. And he sent a message and said, oh, I just want to say thank you. I, I, someone mentioned that, that you said some nice things about me. And I'm like, oh, wow. He said, I've sent you a book to no say way. thanks. And so this is his new book, M Melodic Jazz Guitar from Tim Lurch. So he sent that to me. So thank you, Tim. That's very kind. And anyway, I was just, you know, here I am just casually texting Tim. And I said, oh, you don't happen to do lessons, do you? And he said, oh, do you want to have a Skype? I said, yeah, come on. So we Skyped for an hour and he was showing me his stuff. So he's like, you know, amazing guitar teacher, but wow, really, really awesome. What did you learn? Uh, what did I learn? So. Can you do it yet? N n no. I can't, but what I, what I learned was, how amazing is this, right? I'm going through all the stuff where I'm learning changes and I'm learning the chords and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, Tim starts playing something and it's just mind blowing. And I said to him, what are you, what's going through your mind? Are the chords actually in your mind as you're going through them? He says, Dan, I'll, sh I'll show you what's in my mind as I'm playing this. He starts going, 
And it's just singing. And it's like, all that's happening is I know, I know those sounds so well, and I'm just singing. And it's all melody. I'm like, and this light bulb went on. You know, in the, in the dark, misty caverns of my brain, this light bulb went off and went, ah, okay. Um, that's and we're just you... talking about songs and, you know, actually knowing the songs and knowing the melody and, and, let, and building from there. It's yeah. really, really beautiful. That's what doing the 10,000 hours is for, isn't it? So you just know the sounds. So you don't have to do no. the 10,000 hours anymore. Exactly. So you, you're not practicing while you're playing. You're yeah, playing. You're playing yeah, yeah, yeah. and just having fun. Yeah. yeah. Talking of uh, singing along, <clears throat> I was listening to some Cream the other day while I was walking the dog. Sunshine Your Love, which I'm not sure I've ever listened to in headphones before. Right. Drums all in the right ear. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guitar all in the left ear. <laughs> and you can hear, I'm, I'm walking along, and I think it was, it was sort of, I don't know if it was getting dark or I was a bit scared or something because I was in the woods. There's loads of army where I am, so, you know, they're always secret squirrelling at you. And uh, I'm hearing these voices in my right ear, and I'm thinking, right, this is either the start of something really bad <laughs> or there's somebody there talking to me. Right. It's Ginger Baker. He's like, and you hear him. Honestly, listen to Sunshine of Your Love in headphones. Listen to Ginger giving it, because obviously he will have been doing his Oscar like, Peterson impersonation. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. We also uh, launched a new t shirt this week. Yep. Check that out. Inspired, How awesome is that? Inspired by the famous uh, skateboarding slogan from, from of your. Indeed. That's so cool. Nice. This is a kind of burnt orange colour. There will be a black tea coming uh, presently. So, so yeah. thanks to everyone who's bought one already. Right. Uh, thank you for being here. We should say thank you to, well, BV Ninja, Ninja, we've already done that. Nick Harrington says good morning from uh, Nanaimo, British Columbia. Lovely. Uh, Eagle Ray Rob is on. Who else is on? Sid Gruish or Gruich. Uh, Sid's new. He's uh, from Canada. It's his birthday. Ah, oh, happy birthday, 1971. mate. 1971. So big big year for you uh, last year then, Sid. Um, any thoughts on a 10-way switch for a Strat? Oh, I have enough trouble with five and I only use two of those, so... Really? Sometimes three? Yeah. I, there's a lot of people uh, do that, like it, and that's all good. Um, a lot of people use the, the series parallel thing, yeah. you know, a lot of out of phase stuff, and there's some great sounds to be had with all that stuff. Um, I'm there's enough variety in the sounds that, from the guitar for me with just a normal thing, but I guess it's one of those things that if you play one guitar, like you know, it's like I want if I want a Les Paul sound, I'll grab a Les Paul, blah blah blah. But if, if what you're trying to get is the maximum amount of sounds out of a single instrument, then all that stuff can be really cool. Yeah, I also think if there's a specific sound you need, like if you want the out-of-phase sound, yeah. then you need something that's going to do that. Yeah. Sorry, slight tangent. I can't work out why the... Someone might be able to explain this. Why the, why the audio starts loud and then it gets quieter. I have literally no way of explaining that. Because we start off... There's, a, there's an energy, and then two minutes in, we go, <sighs> breathe. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, hopefully it's loud enough for you all to hear. Um, Ranzer is on. David Clark is on. Um, Rhino Jam is on. James Blessed is from Glasgow. Hello, oh, James. Lovely. Hey, James. Uh, Justin Baylog's on. Nice. Hey, uh, Jeremy Ma Le Mahieu. Nice. Um, Swiss 871. F I Ed. Hello. Hey, Ed. Ed. So, greetings to everyone who's on. Thanks for being here. Let us get into the questions, shall we, Daniel? Mm. I'm watching a lovely Adam Audio ad at the moment. Adam Audio? Yeah. Yeah, nice. I've got a pair of their old A5Xs, which I quite like. Hmm. You know those ads where you don't get more than half a second of of in, in they chop and change and stuff, but it looks really good. 
Oh dear. It's logged me out, obviously, okay. Dan. Obvious, obviously, it's, it's logged me out. Of course, of course. Um, right, so let's see. We've got... Ah, none aligned. It says, greetings from Boston, Massachusetts, in the US of A. Don't um, Massachusetts, please, please, please be quiet. Um, ah, Gordon Rankin says, Mick, some of the audio signals are auto-leveling. Uh, shouldn't be at our end, Gordon. I mean, at our end, we're going into a desk and into some other stuff. What happens out there to YouTube may change, but from our end, at the sort of capture end, it, it shouldn't. Oh, so, okay, so Frankie Holder says, once the stream buffer fills, it compresses the audio and video. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That is a, a Gordon, that might have been what you were talking about. I apologise for, for misunderstanding you. Um... That is interesting. Yeah. Whoa. And annoying. <laughs> I really don't I, I know. Don't like things I that know. make decisions for you. I know, I know, I know. We recently got a couple of um, Sony ZV-1 vlog cameras, and they're really great, and they're full auto. And in full auto mode, they look great. And Mick got one, and I got one, just so we can do some easy point-and-shoot stuff. And Mick calls me and says, you know, how's it going? I said, I love it. I, you know, I can just set it up. I don't have to worry about lights and all that sort of stuff. I, it's great. And I said, how are you getting on? He goes, oh, I hate it. <laughs> and I'm like, what is it? Because I can't do anything with it. It's in, in full order, it looks great. But you can't, there's nothing you, you can control. So Mick's got a vlog coming out this week uh, on a 12 string. And it just looks so beautiful and Thanks, which, there's no way I could make that get it to look like that on that camera however the days the of I've wasted yeah, trying yeah. to get something that I've shot that doesn't look very good look okay yeah they are they're brilliant they're, they are exceptional for that and I've, you know you've got to say modern mobile phones just fantastic aren't they the the yeah yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, questions then. Sorry, I have managed to log back in. Whit Anderson is first up this week. Hi, Whit, and thanks for your question. Woo. He says, I'm a bit religious about tube amps, but I've never thought about tube ODs, Whit is referring to the video we put out on Friday. Um, the tube ODs seem to be more articulate when real dirt was applied. The Les Paul into the Kaluna into the Marshall spoke to me. Mm. Hello, new rabbit hole. Yeah. It was interesting show, wasn't it? It was interesting. It, we it, were both surprised. Yeah. Uh, a couple of people have pointed out, rightly so, um, about the different voltages that are, that the valves are operating at. Some are operating at lower, some are operating higher. Yeah, apparently the tube driver is a starved voltage and it's got um, diodes for clipping. Yeah. So it's, so it's like a tube buffer with <laughs> diodes in it. It sounds amazing. <laughs> Whereas something like the Kaluna is operating quite a high voltage, like 200 plus volts inside, you know, drawing very little current. But, um, you know, so all that stuff. Now, what does it mean? N nothing. Yeah. Because yeah. they sound amazing. Um, but there's, what I'm just saying is there's a whole bunch of different ways. The way I was talking about the way valves clip and the filtering stages and all that sort of stuff. It's all, you know. You can take a valve and you can do as much with that as you can with like a transistor yeah. and make a million different noises with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I agree with your point, Wit, that they did all seem to have a clarity and a fidelity that was not there as evidently in the standard overdrive pedals. Whether that's whether you like that or whether you don't like it, there's quite a few people in the comments were saying actually I just prefer standard overdrive pedals. Yeah, and there's you know? I mean there's certainly things in the standard overdrive pedals that I preferred. They, you know, like the um, all of the all the valve ones, and now they had very full on EQ, and you can I'm sure you can tame this out, but I think that immediate instinct to crank the bottom end up because it sounds so good and it feels so nice to play it like that, but it's the first thing that's going to get you in trouble. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. you get into a band mix, you know. Yeah. Um, but apparently, one of David Gilmore's settings. It was the tube driver with quite a lot of bottom end to make it like fuzzy. Yeah. You know, so, so fuzz really is all enjoys. about, you know, so cranking out the bottom end and square waving it. My next question is, does he play anything below the eighth fret yeah, on the D right. string? Yeah. Nothing that you hear. 
Right, yeah. because then it adds all that extra fatness and fuzziness to the top strings and gives them the hugeness that you want. Yeah. But if you tried to play a you know open E power chord, it would be challenging. Sludge city, man. Yeah. Sludge metal. <laughs> Sorry, just remembering um, conversations with James Brown from formerly of, well, uh, Amp Tweaker, I guess, is where we remember him from last, but I think he's doing something different again now, isn't he? Yeah. I can't remember. Which we can't remember. But anyway. He's an amazing designer. Eagle Ray Rob. Hello, Rob. Hey, Thanks buddy. for being here, as always. He said, all the tube ODs sounded great. Many great choices, depending on the context of the song and arrangement. The tube ODs all had good high frequency extension. They sounded more 3D. I think I would broadly agree with that. Um, he says, are there OD pedals you prefer for Les Pauls? Oh, that's interesting. Well, f uh, so for me, it's less about the guitar, more about the amp. If, it, if, I, if I can get an overdrive pedal sounding good with the amp, I can pretty much plug any of my guitars into it and get a noise out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I tend... For, for that particular Les Paul and and the, the sound of that Les Paul is at, at kind of the of all the Les Pauls I've ever played that one's at the kind of articulate not very strongly mid pushed it's basically like a telly on steroids mm. in a way I mean a telly on steroids is Dan's red telly is what a telly on steroids is but a lot of other Les Pauls I've played have been much thicker in the mid-range, mm. quite a bit more bottom end, or at least the frequency balance is more mid-range and more bottom end, less top maybe, whichever way you look at it. And in that case, like for if if we take average of Les Pauls and call it here, you know, the gold ones over here and some of the ones I like least from the 80s are here. If we say that's where most Les Pauls are, somewhere in the middle of all of that, I tend to prefer overdrive pedals that have less mid-range push that you would expect from something like a Tube Screamer. Right. Because you don't need it with the, with the Les Paul, kind of the same way you don't need it with a Tele. And something that's not too bassy. Yeah. And well, this gives you some options with the, you know, being yeah. able to cut some, some bottom end. And I think what you end up with there is with a pretty open sounding overdrive pedal. Mm. And I always like boosts with Les Pauls. Yeah. Whenever I play Les Paul live, I always run the gain lower. So if I've got whatever gain I've got on the pedal board, I'll use less of it for the Les Paul. Yeah, yeah. Because um, you just, I find I just don't need it. Not only that, the Les Paul goes into compression much uh, worse mm. than the Strat, so it loses definition much more quickly than the Strat. Someone commented on a video this week, um, how they'd played Les Pauls the whole life, but when we showed that trick about just putting it on nine and a half, they're like, wow. Yeah. And just that thing which just takes a little bit of that uh mud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little bit of that out. Yeah. And it's like, oh wow. And that I didn't that, know the definition was there. That comes from two people who've played predominantly single coil fenders, mm. certainly for the, the most of recent history. And then of course you set your pedals and your amp up in a way that's gonna suit that. So when you plug a Les Paul into that, you've got too much of this or not enough of that. You might find the opposite of, is true of people who've played Les Pauls their whole lives plug in a fender and all of a sudden there's too much of this and not enough of that sure. so it's just a balancing act um and not to labor the point but when we were down with uh, joe bonamassa and thank you to anyone that's gone to uh to our podcast and had listened to the the joe p podcast because it's it's amazing it's on patreon and it's available for anyone to listen to if you haven't already listened to it um but he he had his 335 telecaster strat, Les, strat Les Paul, plugging them all in that same rig, they all sounded flipping fabulous. But they all sounded like them. Yeah, you, you could tell I mean? it was a strap. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. weren't hearing, <coughs> even though the 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 dumbbells and everything were cranked. It was the guitars you were hearing, really. You know, and he does that yeah. that thing right, where it just yeah. knocks off a little bit on the Lester, a little bit. Great. And I'll continue to labour the point. You can't do that when you play quietly. There you go. Or when you don't have the headroom, because as soon as you knock off from all out, it's gone. It, it, everything's just gone. So yeah. you need you need you need it all there in the first place. Sorry, Rob, that's a really non-specific answer to a very specific question. I, I just wanted to say, Joe Bonamassa. <laughs> tend to prefer boosts, things with a more even EQ, 
and slightly less gain personally speaking, but you know. Trayvon and Messer. <laughs> yes. And it's the first time I could honk him because I've never met him before. Nice. There we go. I'm a little bit perturbed that the uh, limiter didn't catch that as well as it should have done. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to, to park. I know, I saw. I um, pointed it down there. <laughs> Ran's there. Hey, Ran. Hey, Ran. He says, uh, villains, aka heels. Nice, 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 nice. Um, awesome show on Friday. Tones galore. During your search for the note, you yeah. fall through a portal in space time. Yeah, you do. You sure do. He says, you can come back at any time or place. Oh, no, it's, that's the next question. I thought that was a continuation. Yeah, you do. I think um, to link with what Dan was saying earlier in his conversation with Tim Lurch, you know, what are you thinking of, Tim, when you're playing that melody? Well, I'm singing the melody. And what that means is the middleman of... Um, it, it's a flat sharp diminished 13 bacon uh, over six with chocolate with syrup yeah yeah none of that can be there when you're actually playing that mustn't be there because then you're not in that space time continuum which you're talking about because time stops time stands still and, yeah. and, and the only time you have is now yeah that's the only time you have there's no future there's no past it's now and that is what being in the moment is when it comes to musicians yeah and, and Tim was and saying anything in life. all that stuff when you're playing it just gets in the way. Yeah. You know, so he's just saying, you've got to know it. You've got to know the song. But when you do, you can just play, mm. you know. Yeah. Really and let lovely. it go. There's a lot of trust there, isn't there? Um, and Rand also says, uh, so you can come back at any time or place to be apprenticed by one person and learn every everything from them. Who and when in their life do you join? Uh, uh, Nikola Tesla before he went off the rails so I would as he was uh, inventing the AC motor yeah he you know as far as you know, Da Vinci and all the all the amazing artists and engineers that changed the world. Nikola Tesla for me is the he's the guy. He's that, the one. He's the he's the guy that changed everything. Yeah, yeah. It's hard work, wasn't it, back then? I mean, you imagine being around at um, Da Vinci's time. It was hard work. I mean, Man. it wasn't very nice. No, stuff wasn't very nice in general. But did, so, how amazing is this, right? Da Vinci was at a, looking at a stream, just the current of a stream. And there's some pebbles in the stream and there's looking at the sort of the way the water would flow and the way that would flow back around the stream. From that he worked out how the heart works. And how the blood flows and you know, through the ventricles and the and the it's like imagine being that on it. Did he though? Well, yeah, it's all it's all, did, did, it's all written documented. Did he, did he and do stuff. some dissection and stuff after he, that? He, have you not seen his? Um, no. Oh man, I'll show you some pictures tonight. But he was really into dissecting the body. Oh wow! Well. And his like his anatomical drawings were used for centuries because of the, the detail in no them. No way! Yeah, yeah, un unbelievable. Amazing. I I tried to watch the the uh, dramatization with um, Poldark in it, but I couldn't because I couldn't take Poldark as Da Vinci. <laughs> Okay. It just didn't work for me. Um, <laughs> uh, who would I... Some kind of architect, I think. If, if, or a drummer. If I didn't... If if guitar hadn't worked... Right. And working in this world hadn't worked, I I would like to have built built things. There you go. Some of his... Wow. Dan is showing me pictures of Leonardo da Vinci's sketches of anatomy. Yeah, wow. But just unbelievable. Looks like a Freddy Krueger movie. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, architecture would have been would have been pretty cool. Um, and and as as far as architects go, I don't really know any famous ones um, uh, of the modern era. You know, like, mm -hmm. uh, and when I say modern, I mean like from the thirties on. That would have been my interesting period. So Art Deco. Yeah, stuff when they started to be able to do really spectacular things. I mean, they did spectacular things before that, but when they did big stuff, either that or a drummer, and that drummer would have been Steve Gadd or Steve Jordan. Wow, very good, very good. There Just you go. Two of the most musical dudes ever. 
Yeah. What about if it had to be a guitar player? That is such a good question. Uh, if I had to go and sit at the feet of a master and learn everything, uh, it would have to be. See, if I if I sat at the feet of someone like who was, uh, I'm thinking of someone who's so stylized that you couldn't help but get them rub off on you, then that would be... <laughs> I don't want anyone rubbing off on me, thank you very much. Um, that has to be Pat Martino. Yeah. It has to be Pat Martino. Segovia for me. Oh, nice. Very nice. I'm no fan of classical guitar, but whenever I see him play, it's like, oh my yeah, yeah. word, yeah, I yeah. feel it. That's incredible. I feel it. Anyway, thanks for that lovely question, Ran. Right, Rhino Jam. How are we doing for how are we doing for um thing over? Yeah, probably got turned off. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I better turn the super chats off. I think we're gonna be here for a while to I'll, I'll order in, shall I? Yeah, you better um strap in. It's gonna be a long show. Um Oh a te oh dude! I forgot to tell you. Um Cuthead. That guy that you... Dominic Roig. Dominic Roig. Email me back. You're kidding no, me. No, he emailed me back. I introduced Dan to a record called Walkabout by an artist called Cuthead, who we figure is this dude called Dominic Roig. And I've never knew who, known who he was. And it is an album of the most astonishing guitar playing. Like, it's up there, isn't it? Nick said to me, I want to play this album that I um, discovered when I was working at Guitarist Magazine. And you imagine Nick got sent every album and listened to, listened to all of them. Listened to at least ten percent of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh yeah, you know, I'll, I'll you know, this would be interesting. He's like, oh and god, I was, not again. I was absolutely floored. Some of the best guitar playing I've ever heard. Cuthead, Cuthead, Cuthead's the band, but the band's based around him doing his thing. And the album is called Walkabout. So. I did some research and actually found a website of his, and it's all it's all old, um, like HTML and everything's an image. And and anyway, I sent him an email, and about a week later, he gets, he says, I "Can't believe you managed to find my website." You know, it's sort of hidden, and he was like, "He was lovely, no way, was really lovely." So there you go. Just thought you'd, uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, right, Rhino Jam. Happy Monday from California, Thong Fillers. That would be a Australian thong as opposed oh, very to a ca good. Californian yeah, one, yeah. we would assume. Um, I just picked up a second-hand Maiden D, version 2, uh, and now I'm interested in power amps. How much do they colour the sound? Are they as varied as preamps? Uh, no. They are varied and they do colour the sound, but it's not... A nicely well-designed one shouldn't be a million miles away, which is not to say they don't sound different. But a power amp is specifically designed to be able to have the headroom to take that signal and go here. Yeah. When you're designing, let's say something like a 5E3 circuit, which is I found out something that just blew my mind this week. Um, I was bent down to see Jesse Hoff. Oh, and nice. Get my, get my power cab ready for the gigs. From Lazy J amplifiers. And I measured the signal coming out of the... Because he's done a little preamp tap for me. Yeah. I measured the signal coming out of that. It's like 18 volts. Wow, okay. You know, it's like... So... It's one of those things that it's like... That preamp design... And the same with the, in the matchless. With like 30 plus volts. Um, like massive, massive preamp voltage hitting the, the you know, the power stage. Um but what the what a power amp will do is it'll say I'll just you give me whatever you want yeah yeah I'll just take it I assume though it must have some sort of um, phase inverter and all that stuff in the power amp does it does it have all of yeah. that yeah so it, it's it, not single ended it's still got the it, phase inverter there it still needs all of that sort of front front of power sections end of preamp front front of power section stuff if you're talking about a tube one that is of course um, what do we like love the fifty fifty the two nine five is 
considerably better if you can find one of those. Yep. Um, the Marshall, Marshall was the dual mono block. They, they've done various. The nine thousand one hundred. That's it. The nine thousand one hundred. I think I have one of those. That's 8, pretty good. Thousand something. Marshall do them. The good news is these things are not ridiculous on reverb and eBay anymore because nobody really well fewer people want them than yeah. used to want them. Um, Carvin have made some good ones over the years. Carvin have made some good ones. Um, I think there's even PV ones out there. So yeah, um, and then solid state ones you'll find Anders. many and varied. Yeah. But if you can go tube down, and I would always uh, advise you to do that. Yeah, BK Battle actually did a really nice solid state one that I had for a while uh, before I knew what a valve was, and it was really good. The other thing worth looking at is the Fryat Power Station. There you go. Um, it's only mono the yeah. power station. Oh, okay. Um, so you need two of them if you want to do stereo. However, it's wonderful. Yeah, that's uh, it's got some nice options. Mm. Um, um, congrats on the Maiden D. I, I love mine. If you watch the vlog tomorrow, uh, sorry, it's a twelve string guitar, but you'd get to hear the Maiden D and pretty such a great vlog. Great, it sounds well. Thanks, it's, mate. Uh, man. It's so good. Uh, sorry, I should explain. I Dan and I are doing some that pedal show band gigs with Andy Timmons. And Dan said, do you want any songs you want to do? And I said, yeah, I really want to do Hear My Train of Coming by Hendrix, the Doyle Bramall version thereof. So um, I bought this uh, relatively inexpensive 12 string. And the vlog tomorrow is about getting it, uh, doing some stuff to it, Plugging it in. The fingerboard is totally darkened up. Tuning it down to D. Sounds so good. So yeah, it's cool. Yeah, man, really great. Um, any Anyone looking for a Roger McGuinn impression? Don't watch it. <laughs> Expect loads of octafuzz and uh, vibe and volume coming out of there. Yeah, <laughs> lovely. Um, I Just, do think that that rig is some of the best tones we've had on the show. I'm really pleased with it. Yeah. I'm really pleased with it. I've got a gig in Lyme Regis on the 3rd of June, and I'm going to take it take it there, and it's outdoors, so it should be all right. Give it some love. Give it some yeah, love. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Paddy said, we, it's, uh, so Paddy, the, the pedal show band uh, bass player, hello, Paddy, if you're on. Um, or should I say the bass player who plays bass in the that pedal show band, Paddy does loads of stuff. He said, no, bring that and the two rock. Let's just go crazy. <laughs> nice. It's a bit of a carry, though, from the uh, car park. But you did that at um, the guitar show yeah. in Birmingham a couple of weeks ago, and it was just, it was mammoth. It was mad. I didn't even get punched by the sound engineer either, so it was, was all great. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Justin Baylog, how are hey, you, Justin. TPS fam? Hey, Justin. Um, shout out to the show intros. They're always fresh, inspired, and authentic. Thank you. My guys are Gilmore, Garcia and Paige. However, over the last three years, that space now includes D and M. <laughs> Oi. I don't know what to say about that, Justin. Well, I, uh, yeah, that's very kind of you to say. Very kind. Yeah. I think we can... Uh, let's, not, let's not ruin it. No, let's just move on. Yeah, yeah. And he's uh, hashba hashtagged... Um, hashbag. <laughs> he's hashbagged. <laughs> um, pedal, pedal boarding is not a crime. <laughs> There we there you go. Says so. Thomas Gelnar. Hello, Thomas. Hey, he Thomas. says, Hi, Mick. Hi, Dan. Do you think lacquer, i.e., nitrocellulose lacquer, makes a tonal difference? I'm thinking about removing the poly finish from my guitar and putting nitro on. I bought a very cheap, crappy guitar for experimenting with these things. Greetings. So, it depends on the wood. If you've got wood that resonates, I think it makes a difference. If you've got wood that doesn't, it definitely it definitely feels different to play if you're going to look at the neck and all that stuff as well. Um, all I would say is everything makes a difference. Yeah, it, de it, de it depends on what finish is on there currently and how good the reef in is going to be. There's plenty of um, polyurethane finishes out there that are lovely and thin mm. and I think allow the guitar to, to do its thing. The other thing to remember about nitrocellulose is if we talk about vintage guitars for a second we don't know what it was like when it was new or at least I don't know what it yeah. was like when it was new it might have taken 
many years to get to this sort of fabled state that we like it in now, which is where all the um, uh, the thinners, the what are they, um, the solvent, where all the solvent is completely gone, and it it almost goes so hard that it becomes one thing with the wood, right? Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it never is that, but it, it sort of feels like that. So, I don't know. I if if it's not going to cost you a lot of money, I think it's a really interesting question. Well, I think what you'd be surprised at if you haven't started already is just how difficult it is to get that um, the original finish off. <laughs> When I bought the 70 Strat off Ainsley, he gave me a little bag of paint chips. Oh, you told me about this. That they chipped off it because it had about eight coats of paint on it. And honestly, the little bag's only about that big. And that bag has got some serious weight in it. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. And you think how much total weight that would have added to the guitar. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And it's a bit... Thomas, it's, it's too contentious to say, yes, it sounds different because it would be too difficult to set up a repeatable enough experiment to prove that it did. I think the reasons we like nitrocellulose, the reason that I like nitrocellulose is is 80% because of the aesthetic. Right. Yeah. In straight personal experience, you know, it looks a certain way and it looks it continues to look that way and as it gets older, it, you know, it it just looks that way. Yeah. B, B Maid says, refinishing Apollo guitar is a big job. Stu Mac has a DIY aerosol yeah. video series. That's pretty good info. Yeah. Someone called Nostromo has come on and said afternoon. And I don't know. Um, my daughter is in a band called Nostromo. Oh, OK. So I don't know if the uh, if that's one of the members of the band logging on to say hi. Ah. But uh, she did her first gig a couple of weeks ago. I sent Congra her a video. Congratulations, was, Liv. It was awesome. Um, yeah. So, so proud. <laughs> Doing that, um, the song of lies by the Cure. Yeah, but they did they did Arctic Monkeys and they did some um, Smiths and they were they were really going for it and it was just she was rocking out you know it was just awesome Telecaster you know just really great. Uh, Swizz eight seven one hey gents any advice for recording two amps in a smaller room or bedroom? I have four mics and I want to explore wet and dry and stereo but I don't have a lot of space thank you. Um, So one thing that you can try, to, if you get them in the middle of the room, facing away from each other, and, and that'll give you the best separation, unless you've got you know, something you can partition them with. Yeah. But if you put, yeah, middle of the room, facing, you know, or facing into the corners, that'll give you some good separation. And then you know, maybe put some mics, one on the cab, and then maybe the other one a bit further away. Yeah, you'll be surprised. I mean, if you... The amps don't have to be that far apart. And if you place the mics, you know, further away rather than closer together in relation to the speaker cones, mm. you'll get pretty good separation. And if you pan them hard right and left, you'll you'll hear that you get really good separation for the close mics anyway. Mm. Um, and as Dan said, what, the way we used to record the show, which I, I think it worked really well, and we still do it if we have to do anything on location, is... You stick two mics on the on your two amps. Just imagine that's two amps there because it kind of is. It's wet dry. So you've got one mic on one and one mic on the other. And then we used to use a stereo XY mic about 10 feet away, basically pointing up into the room mm. away from the microphone, from the amplifiers. So those ambient mics are 10 foot away or if, if, it's, if you've got a small space, six feet away, pointing up into the corners of the room, for example, recording a stereo image, and then you can you can mix that in, and I, I think that works great. Yeah. I think that works great. If you don't have a stereo XY mic, then stick the mics themselves somewhere up in the corners of the room. And don't worry about EQing it. You know, your room won't sound great. The, the rooms that tend to sound great are rooms that are, m are built to sound great mm -hmm. or, you know, big spaces tend to sound nice, can sound nice. So don't worry about doing any corrective EQ. Like in here, for example, on the room mics, we have to scoop out quite a bit of muddy mid. So 250 to 500, quite, quite a bit of that comes out. Low end roll off about 50 hertz, boost some of the highs after 10k and that then starts to sound a bit more like what it sounds like in the room because yeah. the room does so much coloration. Yeah. 
that in itself, you know, if you're talking about your space that you have, stick some mics up, just stick them up, play the guitar mm. and get it into a DAW and do some radical EQ shaping on it. And just, if nothing else, you can really start to understand what happens with EQ. Mm. So that's... that's re I remember reading an article, uh, Def Leppard released Hysteria and it was Phil... Colin? Colin, yeah. And as first I'd ever heard anyone mention this, you know, was, but he was basically saying that what you use when you're recording is so different from what you do live. Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. like, I was like, oh, wow, okay. Um, and the way that you approach recording and with all that stuff and with all your EQ, you know, you, you might have the, your, your best guitar sound ever and, you, you know, you get out and you play it live and you've been playing it forever. It sounds amazing the challenge of getting that sound into the box is, you know, not unsubstantial. And it might be that you need to do quite a lot of work to it. You yeah. know, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and don't be worried about doing that. Yeah, exactly. So start with a mic on each amp, and then you can mess around with panning them hard right and left, or having them fire straight down the middle and you'll be able to hear that instantly. Stick up two other mics in the room, and have them pan hard right and left and just experiment with different mixes thereof. So the close mics versus the um, ambient mics in the room. Vary the mix and you'll, you'll get a feeling for it. Also, make sure you flip the phase on each mic individually and listen to what it does to the other three. Right. If the stereo pair are the same, you should be able to have them on the same phase. But your two amps might be out of phase. And whatever's happening in between... If, if they're not the same microphone, blah, 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 blah. Just always do that as a point of good best practice. Check the phase on every single mic. And you can do that by adding a plug-in with a phase flip switch on it. Yep, lovely. Yep. Uh, Airfire, Ed. Hello, hey, mate. buddy. He says, fellas, on the Strat show, you talked about the generalised differences between Rosewood and Maple Mix Strats. Could you elaborate? And also recommend further reading as I think I've had a revelation. I have more gas. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, right. I. Th yeah, you go. Um, it's so hard to extract... A bit like when you say, what do EL84 sound like? You think of a Vox amp. And in that vein, it is very hard for me to extract sounds I know that come from maple neck strats and mm -hmm. those that come from rosewood. My own experience is all other things being equal, which they never are. <laughs> rosewood tends to have bit more lower mid color right and by lower mid i mean what do i mean lower mid i don't know 300 to 800 right a little bit more of that stuff yeah. maybe maybe maple tends to have a bit more upper mid push right and i think that's why they sound really good rocky Right, so you add a bit of gain, and I think that's where you get the aggression. The high end is really interesting, actually. Because maple is always said to be snappy mm. and trebly, but I just I wonder if actually the really sparkly high stuff is what you get off the rosewood guitars, mm. and the maple ones tend to be a bit throatier, for want of a better word. I, so, and there's maple and there's maple. Yeah, right, It's it's too... It's the lower mids where I always yeah. think I can hear it. And I don't know if that's necessarily because the guitars sound different or because the guitar players who've chosen those guitars tend sure. to that general place. Yeah. There's no doubt that like a mid-50s um, maple neck strat is a kind of a ballsier, more aggressive rock and roll machine than like a 60 or a 61. mm which tends to be a bit scoopier and softer. Sure. But what that means to different people is open for debate. Yeah. 
I, there's some like uh, newer maple neck strats um, it sound, can almost sound like there's a really high end limiter just on the top end frequencies. There's, there's like this, the top end is all there, it's beautiful, but it's like it's gone through a something, so it's a little bit, uh, it doesn't pierce. Yeah. You know, looking at maple tellies and uh, rosewood tellies, um, you know, the, the country, you know, the old blackguard maple neck tally is a very different sound from a newer um, modern yeah. maple yeah, neck yeah, tally. Yeah, yeah. The old the old blackguard ones tend to be really warm. Yes. And that's what I love about um, Butters. They it's do. such a warm um, sounding guitar. And then, you know, even more contentious, does it have lacquer on it? Does it have lacquer on the face of the board? Right. I think that makes a considerable difference. Sure. But... And I don't know whether that's to do with the physical attribute of you actually touching the strings and what the string is touching in mm. order to make it help it vibrate. I don't know. Yeah. And and having been listening to Strats, you know, my whole life and gone down the rabbit hole on most of that, I, I can still then pick up a maple neck strat that will change my opinion of what I thought I was hearing. Hmm. It used to be that I thought I was hearing sparkly highs and and all that, but actually it's not that. It's, it, they just sound throatier to me. Right. Rockier. Sure. Like a rockier EQ curve than Rosewood, which is always a bluesier EQ curve for <laughs> whatever the hell that means. <laughs> um, Jonathan Burton says, I agree, Mick. The Peach Guitars video on the Maple Rosewood Silver Sky displays what you're saying. Oh, well, that's, there you go. that's good. Uh, K. Cole, 4001, every piece of wood is different. Yeah, it is. Every piece of wood is different. different. Every piece of wood is great. Stretch Woven wants to know, what's the orangish pedal with gold knobs and blue graphic over Dan's right shoulder in the same square as the Big Muff? It is this. Wonderful uh, Dan Electro fuzz. 3699, Goose Drank the Wine Wine. Um, yeah, it's a take on the old Japanese um, fuzzes, like the Super Fuzz and those sorts of designs. Yeah. Really phenomenal sounding thing. Uh, with octave, if you will. Yeah, that. yeah. It's a lovely thing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm right, we do. We probably need to hurry up, don't we? Oh, no. We always need to hurry up. I know, I know. Hobo Roadie says, Rosewood is for English amps, Maple is for Fenders. That's interesting. That's really interesting. I think Stevie Ray Vaughan would disagree, but right. I can kind of see where you're going. Right. I can see where you're going, given that... Um... Yeah, no, I can't agree. <laughs> Hendrix, I can't agree. There you go. Um... Colin Hardy, can you recommend a replacement trim and block for a Strat looking for an upgrade? Colin, depends whether you want a modern one or a vintage one. Um, Callaham is a, is a good shout. I would also recommend um, Wilkinson. Trevor Wilkinson has done some, I don't know where you are in the world. Trevor Wilkinson has done some really, really, really good vintage specific ones. If, right. that's, if that's what you're after. Um, I would definitely recommend that over the Callaham if you want specific vintage, because the Callaham is not specific vintage. It's a little bit more modern. Yeah. Plastic Co says, slow down, take all night. We're here. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. We haven't eaten yet. What about Meat Feast? Um, Do we have Meat Feast tonight? Oh, I haven't prepared anything. Just the answer is yes. Yeah, we have yeah, Meat okay. Feast at some point. There'll be meat. <laughs> Sam Foyer says, uh, Hi, great show. Really enjoy the guests as well. If you were to put a humbucker in the neck position and a single coil in the bridge, what would you go with? Um... Uh, well, a, oh, well, a path and a telly thing. A, oh, Firebird. Nice. Firebird in the neck. And, uh, yeah, just a big fat telly bridge pickup. Yeah, there's. I, I know this is heresy, but there's no single guitar in the world that I ever want to hear that combination with. In. Yeah, I... Yeah. You know... 
Keith Richards is here to prove us all wrong. And the I, gold foil humbuckers? Uh, no. Okay. Depends. I don't know if you could get humbucker ones. The ones I've got are single coils, I right. think. Um, and, and, and surely down the years, there are many examples of where this statement is wrong, but I just don't ever want to hear that combination. Right. Oh, this is interesting. Chris Quinn says, the Dano pedal is a Fox Tone machine. Yes, which is that design. And the, uh, he says, the guy that owns Dan Electro started Fox when he was a kid. Ah, very interesting. Steve Gutenberg. How? Why? I'll remember in a minute. Um, yeah, not, not really for us, that combination, Sam. Like, and I think that's because we both really like traditional guitars. So if I think Humbucker, I think Les Paul 335 and SG. And if I think single coil, I think Strat, Tele mm. and P90s. Yeah. So may, maybe, 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 maybe there's a case for a P90 and a Humbucker. But oh, okay. I'm just not a big fan of Humbucker neck tones no. outside it's of already... the Clapton, Clapton woman tone. Yeah, thing. yeah. And oh, so, yes, um, Lee Tintler said Andy Summers. Yeah, he did have that combination of his Strat and his Tele. Actually, Joe Bonamassa had a his old black guard yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and it and it can work and it can sound great it's just not something that we would choose for us personally no, having never used it to any great effect yeah uh jeffrey raddick keep up the good work gentlemen says jeffrey thank you mate thank you jeffrey uh mike 2203 fan hello mike he says hello dnm my squire strat goes out of tune when you use the whammy bar can you fit a hard tail to fix this or should i just screw the tail down mike there's get, a th get in the ready. vlog. In the vlog, we did it, where we went over, and we looked at all the points. Oh yeah. Um, yes. Yes. What video was that? It was in the. Uh, it was very recent. Let me have a look. You you continue. It was very recent. Um, the problem you've got, Mike, is what's happening is when you. When you move the block, right? Come on, please focus. Focus here. When you move the block, the, the biggest point of... Well, you've got a number of points of friction. Dan's going to tell you what the video is. It's Are You In Tune? Yes. Watch the Are You In Tune video, and we talk about this in detail, but the quick answer is, right from here where you wind the strings on, string trees, nut, keep coming back. Any place where the string touches the guitar is a point of potential friction, so you must, must, must make sure that is lubricated. What a lovely ha guitar. However, the biggest, the biggest culprit are these six screws you've got here and I'm assuming your Squire has a six screw bridge, they're almost always screwed down too tight. And if they're screwed down too tight, that means that when you push it, they can't release again. So the rule of thumb is slacken the strings off, screw the outer two down so the bridge just touches the body, so it's flat on the body. Mm. Make the four centre ones the same and then unscrew them a little bit, a quarter turn. Right. And that makes sure that you've got all the pressure against the screws so that it's not causing any trouble, but it's not screwed down so tight that it can't return to pitch. Just sat here. I can, that guitar sounds just immense. As a, I'm, you know, and that's just a matter of setup and it being uh, lubricated. And it doesn't have to be a flipping 1961 strap for that to be the case. Your squire will do it just as well. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Very yeah. nice. But it's a case of um, working through each of those potential points of slippage yep. and friction 
and eliminating each one. Oliver Boyce says, Mick, on the 61 Strat, I noticed the tip of the trem arm is black. Is that a retrofit or an original feature? Great story. Simon's dad. So um, the guy bought it off Simon Green. Simon's dad is an artist uh, whose stage name was Daniel Boone. Is Daniel Boone. He's retired now. Simon sent me a picture of his dad in 1961 having bought the guitar and pushed on to the end of the, of the tremolo arm. Can you see it? Is a Campagnolo, um, a Campagnolo, which I, it must be like a gear lever thing from a bicycle because Campagnolo make bicycle parts. So I'm assuming it's a gear lever or a brake lever or something. Anyway, um, Peter is his real name. Put that on there in 61, or at least I've got a picture of him in 61 with it on there. And I just don't have the heart to take it off because then you see pictures of, of Peter through the years, Daniel through the years, um, and a few videos of him playing the guitar and it's on there. <laughs> it's great. It's a great, great story. And it's just part of the guitar's history and heritage so I, I can't bring myself to to take it that's cool it's it's very cool yeah that's very cool yeah so um yes thank you for asking that question i love telling that story it's great um god dan we are going to be here forever <laughs> um we've been in an hour we've answered three questions <laughs> and mike just finally if you really if you if it's doing your nutting and you just Nut. can't, can't be bothered with it just buy a couple of extra screws, or they, they may have come with the guitar springs, sorry, and put five springs in it, and that will pull the thing flat. You don't need to block it. Yeah. Although it is subtly different. Blocking it is kind of interesting because it does, it's a subtly different tonal response, blocking it as, as opposed to just using the springs. But yep. five springs, screw the trem claw things in, and that will pull it tight enough for it not need to be blocked. Bev has just reminded us because we're a bit rubbish at it. Uh, again, thank you to our patrons listening on Patreon, on listening to the podcast of this. Indeed. Indeed. As always. Thank you. Um, regular patri patron giveaways, if you're not a patron. We give away a pedal a month, um, either something from our own personal stash or something that a manufacturer has kindly let us give away. Um, yes. Lovely. Yes. Uh, Namatanui, Namatanui Dupont. Bless you. <laughs> Hello, Leggins. Thanks for the show and inspiration. Do you have any recommendations for patent number pickups to put in an SG? Patent number pickups being, well, I guess once they had the patent number, they were no longer patent applied for. PAFs. Yeah. Original Gibson humbuckers. Yep. So, uh, was it patent... Applied for. No, but the other one? Oh. Patent granted. Yeah. PG. PG. <laughs> there you go. Um, Got some pigs. Quite, uh, all right. I have fairly limited experience of SGs. I've, I've, have I ever owned one? Not sure I've owned one. I've long-term borrowed a few over the years. But wasn't our first guitar each, both as uh, an old co SG copy? Yeah, not quite the same thing. No, no. <laughs> Now, normally, so on other Gibsons, on 335s and, and Les Pauls, I like as traditional as possible pickups. So asymmetrically wound, not much potting, so they sound open and airy, and I really love that in a, in, on a 335 or an SG, uh, uh, on a, a Les Paul. On an SG, I actually don't mind the 57 Classics. I think they sound oh. pretty good, which yeah. is not that. You know, they're symmetrically wound, loads of quite heavily potted, I think. They tend to sound flat to me in, in um, Les Pauls and, and 335s, but I had a Derek Trucks SG for a while, and I'm pretty sure that had 57 classics in it. And that sounded great, right. that guitar. Oh, yeah. absolutely mega. Yeah, it did. It did. So, all of which is to say, I, I'm definitely not the right person to ask. That's just one... Um, one example of personal experience. Let me give Derek a call. Yeah. I'll ask him. Desmond! I've always liked the pickups on your guitar. <laughs> Can you tell me what they are? 
I'm going to finish every sentence with a question. <laughs> so hmm. funny, my sister was over last week, which is why we didn't do the show on Monday. My sister was over from Australia. Haven't seen her in over four years. And it's my little sister. And as soon as she comes in, Ten's just like, oh, you're Australian again. Yeah. So funny. <laughs> How was she done? Was it nice to see her after all oh, this it was, time? It was really lovely. Her husband had come, have, had come out with her. This is their first holiday in four years. He walks in. He's got a bit of scratchy throat. He tests himself up in his room. He's got COVID. Oh, no. So he had to isolate in the oh. top floor for like, you know, five days or whatever it is. Um, you had to put him in the east wing. We did. Yeah, we just did. send a send a man out to attend to his needs. Had to put slices of cheese under the door. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you know, apart from that, it was great. Um, so yeah, Nama Tanui. Uh, depends what sound you want, of course, as well. Uh, S famous SG players down the years. Who do we think of? Um, Tony Iommi, Angus Young, Derek Trucks. Was this, I... Listening to some Angus Young today. Who am I missing? Um, you're missing Jimi Hendrix, very briefly. <laughs> anyway, if we take those three, <laughs> all quite different sounds, right? So I owe me more at the metal end when metal was metal. Um, Angus, hard rock and Derek Trucks blues. Now, it would be interesting to know what pickups were in each of those guitars. I was listening to some ACDC today. George Harrison. And the... The sounds are so different on all the songs. You know what I mean? There's an Angus sound, but there was like, it was like Highway to Hell came on and Back in Black and there's, there's a few songs came on. I was like, oh man, they, you know, just the recording process and the way those songs are mixed, the guitar sounds are all really different. Really? Yeah, yeah, man. Well, I'll show you some stuff tomorrow. But you have listened to the songs back to back. It's like, oh wow, really cool. Zappa, of there course, Tim B, thank you, and Casey Cole, 4001, Gary Clark Jr. Mike Campbell, dear, yeah, but it wasn't his, he used the thousand guitars. Um, but guitarist yeah. says, I've got a f set of 57 classics, um, and 57 classic plus, if you or Mick can use them, they will be gifted to you. That's very kind of you. Rob Krieger from The Doors. Oh, yeah, there you go. They had a, he had a signature one, didn't he? So, I, you know, if I had to choose without knowing anything, I'd just buy. I'd find the boutique pickup manufacturer that was closest to me, and I would buy their nearest Bob on PAF set. So that would be like Monty's, I guess, here in the UK or bare knuckle. Um, Omax fours. Yeah, all those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I would go. But you know, I just, I don't know. Would be interested if you want a more pushed hard rock into metal sound then maybe the choice would be different but. yeah Santana in the, in the early in the early days you know my favourite Santana sounds were recorded with his old Yamaha SG uh, is that and that and an old boogie I think Mark one yeah yeah well Just. he he coined the name he said man that thing really boogies no way to to Randall Smith that's the that's the famous story yeah yeah that's hilarious um Adam wants to know hey Mick what pickups did you end up putting in blue um, I gave up, Adam. Um, the the ones that were in it um, the most, I think, were either the Ron Ellis fifty sixties or the um, Andreas Klopman sixty set. I like both of those equally, and they seem to suit the guitar pretty well. Interestingly enough, um, in a Strat vlog that I started doing and then gave up because it was killing me, <laughs> um, it it might see the light of day at some point. Is that because of the lighting in the other room? No, no, no. God, no. It's just a story for another day. Um, one thing that's pretty cool about the Texas Specials in the, in the CS Strat mm. is that they do have this sort of mid-push, and that, that sent me down a learning experience about mid-60s pickups in Fenders, which has been enlightening. Uh, the, the, the problem with the CS is they're sort of off the top of the scale of, of what the actual mid 60s pickups would have done you know they're more aggressive they're more brighter they're more, right too much of all of that but i did actually start to quite enjoy the more mid 60s 
sound. And interestingly enough, Mark Foley sent me a set, which are a kind of a prototype that he's working on just to get a bit of feedback. And well, I don't know about feedback, but what did I think? Um, and I quite liked them in blue. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not. They weren't a strict. They were. They were a different thing. I shouldn't say too much because I'm not sure if Mark's going to put them out or not. They were a different approach to all of that, and I quite like them. So, what am I saying? I'm saying I don't think the problem with blue is the pickups. Sure. I think it. it it's a great guitar. It's a great guitar. It's my guitar, but yeah. it just doesn't sound as good as the 70 the 61 or the custom shop it just doesn't yeah those those three threats it's all there yeah you know and that's that's unfortunate but it's true sister rosetta sharp yes tharp her, her, tharp, tharp tharp sister rose so that's a tharp, tharp. so yeah. yes and her white custom three pickup if you've never seen that video go onto youtube now and watch it or those videos she is amazing <laughs> yeah um people are saying the um Pete Townsend live at Leeds. It felt he was playing a, it was a junior. A junior. It? No, no, it's special. a special with the P nineties. Yeah. Very very cool guitar. Yeah. Um. Good. Right. God blimey. Um. Brett Tozzi or Totsi. Hello, Brett. He says, "DNM love from Charm City." Is there a place called Charm City? Unless, so who is it? Uh, it's Brett Totsi from America. Oh, okay, no. Or Tozi. I thought, he, I thought he might sure. have been talking about somewhere in Australia after the, um, after the the my favourite film of all time, The Castle. Baltimore. And he's got a he's got a fake chimney on his roof, and the guy's evaluating his house. He goes, "What's it there for?" He goes, "Charm." Just, just adds a bit of charm. I thought he might be talking about that area. <laughs> Apparently, Charm City is Baltimore. Okay. It, uh, uh, streets of Baltimore. Watched a great documentary. It's very old about Emmy Lou Harris the other night. Right. Um, and Graham Parsons and that whole thing. Man. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want my wet pedals in my Messrs. Effects loop through my One Control Iguana tra Tail. Would running a wet loop in my one control still put those effects through the front of my amp you still have to so you still have to split the signal um so what you need to uh oh hang on so you want your wet effects just in the loop right you're not going a wet dry you just want your wet effects in the loop um so all you got to do is you Choose the loop after you got your effects you want to go on the in the front of the app file. You have those in the first loops. You choose the loop after that, the send goes to the input of your amplifier. Effects send from the amplifier goes back to the return of the loop on your one control. What you've done there is you've put the preamp of your amplifier in that loop. And then after that, basically all those effects that are after that are seeing the preamp. So that's effectively putting those effects in the loop. Then from the output of the one control back to the effects return of the amplifier. A couple of things to look out for. Um, I don't know what the the signal level is, and I don't know what your wet effects are. If you're looking at putting analog effects in the uh, after the preamp, unless your amplifier is a a proper instrument level effect send, so. Um, a good example is uh, uh, Friedman amplifiers, proper instrument level effects end. Unless it's that, you might struggle because a lot of the old analog, especially the modulation things, they don't have huge amounts of headroom. Yeah. So just be careful of that. Also, the other thing is when you do it like that, you are creating a path to earth from the front panel of the amplifier or so you're creating another path to earth from the front panel of the amplifier to the back panel of the amplifier. And that can cause issues. So it might, um, valve amplifiers uh, can be really uh, finicky when it comes to, or finicky when it comes to the, the path to ground. 
Um, but that's how you do it. The only other thing to remember is the loop that you have your preamp in, you need to leave that loop on on every preset. Otherwise, your signal is going to go straight, going to bypass the preamp and go straight to the power amp. So, yes, the, the effects you want in the front of the amplifier are in your first loops. Choose the loop you want on your one control to put your preamp in, and then the loops after that for your post preamp effects. There Boom. you go. Done. We have done videos on that. Um, yes. So it's basically the four cable method, but adding a switcher. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So if you don't, if you haven't heard that term before, four cable method, um, Google that and then start drawing diagrams. Daniel Herbert. Hello, Daniel. He says, just saying hello and thanks from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I haven't been able to catch VCQ or even episodes lately. Glad to join for a bit today. You guys ah. are great and always inspiring. Thank, Thank you, you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much. Hi, chaps, says Andrew Jones. Hello, Andrew Jones. Recommendations for a delay in a reverb pedal. I've got a Dr. Z Maz 18, which is epic. You must try one. So delay and a reverb pedal in one. Um... Or a delay as well as a reverb. Delay and reverb in one is easy. We always say the Source Audio Collider. Spectacular. Spectacular pedal. That, that one's amazing. Um, man. There's just so many. So some of our favourite delays. Um, Free the Tone, Future Factory is always up there. It's just superb. Um, echo system and you've got things like you, you know timeline if that's you know if, if what you're after is more expansive delays if what you're after is a really simple delay um, then oh man there's you so know, where do you, you, you Andrew w we've done a bunch of videos on uh, delay pedals I think how to choose and using them in the band there's there's two videos we've done, one with, one with delay pedals and yeah, one with reverb pedals yeah, yeah. using the band. Go and watch those because our faves are on there and yeah. you see and, and have listened to what you like. But it's so, I mean, it's such a vast chasm of yeah. goodness. I mean, delay, just taking delay, for example, do you want an analog sounding slapback or do you want an expansive ping pong? Well, no, you can't have ping pong because you're not stereo. Uh, a multi head, multi tap thing, yeah. Type delay so i think you probably need to um go and check those videos out because it'll yeah. what it'll help you do it'll help you define what you want yeah but best of luck <laughs> well you should have seen the cover they wanted to do says albus band <laughs> in honor of your great episode and a confirmed se sequel to spinal tap i ask is a hot dog a sandwich or not Oh, my love. I hope you're well. Aaron, thank you for the continually brilliant questions. <laughs> I think we should uh, we should make the caveat, the the um, geographical caveat that hot dogs are not the same here in the UK as they are in the US, right? Why are they not? This is the bun with the sausage. It is, but in like in in the US, a hot dog is a cultural icon icon yeah it is still a, a hot dog yeah but if you go to a restaurant street stand anything around here and try and get a hot dog oh no of course the only yeah, place yeah, yeah, you yeah. can get one is from a like quite a rare so they're not here what they are there sure i mean i don't i don't get wooden clogs down the road but if i was in holland i could go a street corner get, they're still clogs they're still again i just i just don't know i don't know because here like a hot dog would be like a like a unless you go to a cinema now in cinemas they still have that reformed frankfurter no. what you, you know what need, i'm saying what you need is 2 a.m in the morning a spa services <laughs> that's had that same oh, the same desperate piece of meat rolling in that thing for weeks <laughs> And they've got a they've got a bet on behind the counter who actually buys it. That's an episode of The Simpsons, surely. <laughs> Where Apu's waiting for someone to come in and finish it off. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in in the in the UK, it's going to be more like a meaty sausage. It's going to be like a like a banger. And in and then the, the further um, 
east we go, once we get to Germany, now you're talking, right? Now you're talking. Because if ever there was a country of sausage, it's Germany. I would never forget being at the airport. We were going to Ger- we were coming back or something, and this family went to the airport. Like really, you know, lovely family. It was like 10 a.m. or something. They sat down. They each ordered this massive sausage, and they and him and her both had these massive things of beer. Yeah. And like 10 a.m. in the morning, it's like. Germany, baby. It's That's awesome. every German. Every German every does German. that every morning, just in case you were wondered. <laughs> <laughs> you were wondering. Um, so, I think, I think as you, as you, if you start in California, and you end up in Berlin, I think the sausage gets meatier. Right. Okay. There's like a big void, no meat. It's like a fish sausage all the way across the Atlantic because there's no there's no meat there, right? It's just fish. And then you you hit you hit the west coast of Ireland, and by the time you're in Germany, it's just solid meat, right? Yeah. So the, to the to the actual question, um, is a hot dog a sandwich? I think no. I think no because. A sandwich has to be between two, two pieces, pieces of, bread. of bread. It's exactly right. Whereas exactly a, right. a roll is a singular item. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. It's like a wrap. It's not a sandwich. Yeah. No. There, there you we go. are. There we are. I think we're unequivocally united on whether a hot dog is a sandwich. Yeah. Very good. It's the dogs I feel sorry for. That sausage show, says Simon Park. <laughs> it's a taco, says Danny Burford. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's very good. Uh, I am hungry now, though. Uh, Stanislav Migra says uh, the country of sausages is hungry. Well, I'm pretty hungry. Yeah, me too. too. Me too. <laughs> Sorry, you, you set them up, we'll knock them down. Um, French hot dogs are incredibly underrated, says uh, Oliver Boisin. Well, um, I think that's interesting. You've got to be careful buying a sausage in France. Really? Yeah, because the, 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 the offal sausages are a little more prevalent. Oh, okay. And I've, of course. I've slipped up a couple of times right, well, you've thinking that looks like a nice sausage and end up eating a load of ventricles. Okay. Which, you know, it's fine. It's I, ha- I had, you may as well eat I the had uh, offal when I was... I went to, I went to um, Lyon and uh was there to see a gig and they said oh you know this is our our local dish and it was awful and it was delicious yeah well i mean and it was really nice you know go to a posh restaurant you're gonna get some liver yeah. and kidneys and yeah, stuff yeah. aren't you it's the yeah. it's the tripe bit i'm not so keen on i saw robert plant there and it was this old roman amphitheater speaking of tripe <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um <laughs> Hey guys, love the show says 6666. Interesting your numbers there. Mike, I would like to wish my car a happy 111,000 111 miles this oh, week. Oh, oh, fantastic. Yeah, Lovely. I took I took a picture of the uh said mileage. Well done. Um, Anyway, 6666 says, um, Hi guys, love the show. Looking for a boost pedal to go after a Chase Bliss preamp Mark II. I want a nice volume lift. What would have enough volume? Oh, there's loads. Kili Katana is a good one. The, um, tell you which one, I really love the, oh yeah, of course, Heavy Water. That adds a bit of grit or something to it, but it's a magic sounding thing. Um, if if all you're after is pure DB lift, then the Hampstead Ascent. Hampstead Ascent is glorious. Um, but, you know, something simple. The, the Keely Katana is a killer boost. Yeah. If you want something a bit... Uh, a bit grittier than the Bad Bob boost from Analog Man is spectacular yeah, I, think the, I think the chase bliss is gonna overdrive that right too much yeah um yeah z- check out the zio from source audio as well very good could be worth a look my my choice would be the keely right uh sorry the um let me rewind that uh my choice would 
be the Thorpey Heavy Water, heavy water yeah. ev- every day of the week. Yeah, it's lovely. Big fan of that. Good luck. Uh, George Ratcliffe. Hello, George. Hello, George. For TPS style wet dry, mm-hmm. can the split after the drives be done with a simple passive box and phase toggle, or is some buffering required? How are you going to flip the phase? I mean, what you could do is flip the phase on the speakers of your amplifier. Are you saying in order to flip the phase, it needs to be active? Well, no, but you need to have at least a transformer to be able to flip the phase. But the problem that you're going to have is if you're going into a passive splitter with a transformer is the load. So the signal going into that is at some point going to have to... If you've got an overdrive pedal that's always on, you won't have an issue. But if you passively split and then you know with the load of the transformer then you are going to find that this does load the guitar a bit you might like it i know you know i know some people do um oh man not nobody um so who's that eric clapton again that was it yeah he's still you know he's he won't leave it alone will he no he won't he won't i'll get back to you soon eric uh right so yes, you can do it passively with the transformer, but splitting passively at the transformer does create issues. Um, yeah, but now what you what you can do is that that you can just split it like a one in two out thing, and JHS does a number of yeah. s- such I- items. Yeah, and that, and it's really simple, and you might be okay. The, the reason for having it one amp isolated and phase reversible is that if if you're using two amplifiers, it's a 50-50 split whether they're in phase or not. So having the option to split... And, what, and once you invoke Sod's Law, it's guaranteed that they won't be. So having the option to split the phase is really important. Um, and then, you know, for me, an active splitter that doesn't load the guitar so I can just be bypassed to the splitter is always more um, yeah it just it just solves a bunch of problems you know but by all means give it a go hope that helps Um, he says I'm currently using a wet the wetter box sends for the split with great results but can it be simpler it can be much simpler get humdinger Right, there you go. Yeah, and that's great. One side is buffered, but you get everything you need in the tiny little box, and it's got a phase, and I just, I'm, it's utterly indispensable for me. Awesome. So um, Thank you, bud. There you go. Uh, Noodle Factory. Noodle Factory. You guys have been an inspiration. After not being in a band for many years, I've now joined two. Oh, wow. Good well on Well done. Um, I love it, but I've got a lot of songs to learn. Any tips for learning a lot of songs in a short time? Uh, just go and don't stop. Um, yeah, man. I'm, I'm quite fortunate in that, well, up until this point, I've always been able to learn songs um, quite quickly. I'm struggling at the moment a little bit just because I haven't had to learn songs for so long. Um but I find if I do if I do it in a really concerted, if I, I sit down and go right, I'm going to spend four hours today and hear my songs. And I'm going to just I'm going to play through them at least once, and then make a note of what I need to work on, you know. Um, but also make a playlist of them and just play them yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It also depends what your role in doing those songs is. So if you've got loads of intricate solos and stuff to learn, and that's that's a challenge because you then you need to chunk the learning. Um, the way I do it is, let's say it's uh, like acoustic gigs, mm. for example. So I won't be playing any solos. All I need to remember is the chords and the words. So I'll literally do what he just said. Number one, make a playlist and don't listen to anything else. Mm-hmm. And when you're in the car, put the playlist on. When you're out walking, put the playlist on. When you're doing something that doesn't require you to be listening to anything else, put the playlist on, have it in your ears and preferably sing along. Yep. And then that will, by osmosis, um, improve your sort of core knowledge of the um, arrangements and stuff like that. 
what I then do is I write the words out, type the words out, and I get it all on one sheet of paper. Most songs will fit on one sheet of paper if you go to about 20 or 22 point type. Um, and then I then write the chords above where they change, right? which sounds really old school, but that's how I do it. And then I transfer those PDFs onto an iPad so that I've always got it there. Oh, nice. Now, that's that's not way number one. Um, and I've done that for years. So I've now got a library of song PDFs. So if I go do an acoustic gig, I've probably got 40 songs that I can do and I can just have it there and just get a rem reminder of what the chord is. It's pretty labour intensive, but it is a, a reminder. And a lot of people are like, oh, no, I want it all in my head. It just won't stay in my head. Mm. So I've got to have a reminder. I asked uh, dear Joey Honk to help me learn a song the other day. I couldn't work the chords out and I couldn't work out where the changes were. It's a Ray Charles song. And because the bass is leading everything and he's always playing leading chords to everything, I couldn't work out what the primary chords were. C. C sharp as it goes. Okay. Um, he was tuning up. And uh, on the <laughs> and it's it's the standard Ray Charles type progression, but I was really struggling with it. And uh, so Joey said, "Yeah, sure." And he literally, I don't know, ten minutes later, he's charted the um, the song for me using the Nashville method. Right. Very briefly. So let's say our song goes A, D, E. On my song sheet, it would say A, D, E. On Joey's song sheet, it would say one, four, five. Because if you know your chords, mm -hmm. you know that this is one, this is two, uh, this is four and this is five based on the um, degrees of the major scale. Two, three, four, five. What that means is if you chart them out that way and you know your chords, if the singer turns up and says, ah, can't do it in A, got to do it in A flat because my voice is a bit funny, which is what singers always say, your chart that now says A, D and E is useless to you unless yeah. you transpose very quickly. If it says one, four and five, you know. And the more you look at it, the more it starts to make sense and you more th that you realise that six minor is, is there yeah. and three and the three seven is there. takes a minute and I'm not good at it yet but I have committed to learning oh well done the basic Nashville and and there's other stuff so if it's if it's got a minus next to it it's a minor it, uh, the diminished sign would be the same and it can get very compl complex very quickly but for mm. most rock and roll songs you're going to be dealing with one four five six minor a two here and there and it should be fairly simple yeah I would strongly recommend looking at that method of doing it yeah and it forces you to learn a chord or two yeah mel hackinson says just get tabs off the internet fast and free uh, so what i would say is they're always wrong like 90 percent of the time they're wrong but also you are there is an opportunity to learn something if you sit down and work it out by yourself by listening to it there are times where you can get stuck and then go and go and have a look at the chord don't waste hours trying to work it out although that can be really great if you've got the time but what you'll find is when you start working out things by ear then you'll notice a lot of the same progressions in a lot of the same songs um so it's a really it actually will help you as a guitar player if you sit down and, and just try and work it out yourself right i totally agree with that it's worth the time absolutely worth and the time. once you start once you start seeing songs that go uh, one, two, four, six minor, mm. you're like, oh, that's about 60% of Motown pop songs. Sure. Et cetera. And you just start hearing the, you just start hearing the changes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Good luck. Good luck. Uh, it's the Nashville number system. Um, yeah. 
if you if you fancy that. Um, Namatanui, Namatanui Dupont again says, uh, hello again, have you tried the PRS HDRX amps, oh, Hendrix amps? They're a recreation inspired from the amps that Jimmy used at Woodstock. Yeah, I watched the video with Paul and Doug Sewell, maybe? Right. Um, and who else was there playing? Someone else was playing them. Yeah, uh, Paul Reed Smith was allowed, let's get this right, maybe Paul and Doug were allowed to take the Woodstock amps to bits or at least really oh, look really? at them. Oh, interesting. And um, haven't tried them, haven't tried them. Yeah, I'm sure they're great. Great story, though. Yeah, really great mm. story. Um, yes, I, I'm trying not to be disparaging about it. Because the Woodstock amps were slightly modified, weren't they? Apparently. So they've, they've understood what some of those mods were. Okay. Um, and when I say I'm trying not to be disparaging about it, it's like... Oh... You, you hang so much off the back of Hendrix. Right. This is the exact amp he used, and this is the exact universe. You take him out of the equation, and it's all fooey. Right. Isn't it? Yep. It's just... He was so unique, and he was so original, that I don't think having the amp that he used is going to help anybody. Sure. Is that too grumpy? No, no, no it's not. Um, you know, I've plugged into some some of those classic famous people's amplifiers and I just sound like me plugged into one of those amplifiers yeah see I prefer that I, I yeah, prefer the, totally. the Dumble thing where you know you, you plug into a Dumble and you are you yeah yeah sure or, but, and, and, and to be fair if you plugged into one of Hendrix's Marshalls you're still you aren't yeah, you yeah yeah I, I remember plugging into Andy Timmons rig um, at a sound check with Simon, Simon Phillips I'm like man that's the best guitar sound I've ever heard and I, he said can you know, have a try and plug it in mm. I'm like I still sound like a, you know, <laughs> tried really, really hard. So, yeah. Ne nevertheless, trying to be less grumpy about it, it would be interesting to play them. Totally. And just to see how, like, viscerally bonkers they are. Yeah. I'd love to know what the mods are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Doug Sewell talks about it a little bit in the video, I think. I think. Curtis. Ah, oh, hello, Curtis. Hey, Curtis. End of legs. The scent of vine, uh, vine, fine birch plywood, freshly cured paint and glue and Tolex warmed by a quartet of simmering 6L6s is magic. Any thoughts? This is a fantastic question. Any thoughts on the importance of senses other than sound for inspiration? Ah, oh, man. Love from Kansas City. I spent Christmas in Australia four years ago and... They had a like a child's toy guitar and staying on a farm and it was so beautiful and just being in that environment and I wrote this instrumental thing on this guitar that was impossible to play. Please tell me it was in D minor. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, simple lines intertwining buddy. <laughs> Sorry. It's my son. Um, uh, so, but it was just being in that environment. Like, like for me, I find architecture really inspiring. Mm. And I love going into, you know, Siren or, you know, these places that the Siren Sester. Siren Sester. And I just find for me that sort of stuff fills my soul. Yeah. And it puts everything in perspective for me. Yeah. You know, and. Abs like so visually for me, um, that is absolutely massive for inspiration. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question, Curtis, because I mean, I guess the science has some answers, or at least has has some research to to explain this way better than I can. But you know, any any experience is a collection of senses, and in humans, I suppose that not all of our senses are functioning at the same, I don't know, efficacy, level, whatever you want to call it, uh, as others. So some people are hard of hearing, some people can't see, uh, some people can't taste. 
and of course it's not can taste can't taste it's like there's a surely there's a a spectrum of being able to to sense any of these senses we then add in um environmental factors we add in uh nurturing factors in terms of what you've been taught mm. to hear or taste or smell and all of a sudden each individual's experience of this con of combination of senses is an entirely unique thing which is why i've always had such a problem with people saying this is how this sounds right now, I know I've been guilty of that as a magazine journalist and also on this show, but if you just stop and think about it for two seconds, it's why we say on TPS there are no answers, only better questions. And it's why we... It's why we try to say, I like this and I like this less rather than this is better than that, even though, of course, we fall into that trap too. Because all you've got is your, is your combination of those senses. I'll use the analogy of food. If you suddenly stop smelling you know a, a nice piece of whatever it is you like to eat and a really decent bottle of whatever it is you know just doesn't work mm. in the same way that it did now add the ambience of uh, a nice restaurant or uh, your home with with decent lighting let's talk about the textures of your table um the your surrounding environment in terms of how much green foliage there is all these company th yeah right yeah. human company so yeah. To answer your question, I was go. I would go so far as to say, uh, as the sum total of all the other senses is actually more important than the sound. Sure, I wholly believe that. And then, so when you add the sound together, then that experience is what makes it unique. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I feel I feel quite passionate about all of that actually because yeah. it's a really massive philosophical question. Yeah. I think and also one of the things that um and it's why you can't measure sound on an oscilloscope. Yeah. Yeah, you can look at frequencies and stuff, but the the man, a guitar signal is so complex. There's so much going on. But we, you know, one of the things we don't do generally is blind tests because it's like what's that really saying it's like everything matters the way it feels is important the way you know the way it makes you feel when you play it all that stuff and it doesn't matter if it's psychosomatic if it's real to you it's real you know like for example um i've got um so i'm just thinking about what's on my board at the moment um Okay, the Merith Reverb. You know, it's a new reverb. You can buy them off the shelf. And I remember plugging into that thing for the for the first time going, this has really sparked something in me. I love it. Mm -hmm. Is it the best reverb in the world? Doesn't matter. For whatever reason, when I plug into that thing, I feel something. It's the only thing that I really care about at this point in my life. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah. It's the, it's the only thing I'm measuring it by. It's like... How do I feel when I turn that thing on? Yeah. Yeah. This I takes a bit of confidence to do that, doesn't it? I think it takes a bit of knowing that you're okay to trust that, that level of judgment. Sure. But I think I, I guess what I'm saying is we get a lot of people that says, just tell me what to just tell me what to buy. Mm. And what we're saying is no. If if that's that's the wrong thing to ask. What yeah. we're saying is what we hope we inspire you to do is on this journey find things that inspire you and find things that connect with you you know what i mean and and that's all part of it yeah it is so thanks for the question curtis yeah, we, we think great it's question. every bit is important lucas k says i bought a marshall 1987x two weeks ago which is what we've got somewhere here um and it's way gainier than i thought did you mod anything on yours or did you swap the preamp tube to get more headroom um i actually think it does have a 5751 in v1 right um because it is as you say gainy jump the channels if you haven't already done that and um, we tend to run the high treble channel so it's just on yeah unless you we want it overdriving and then use the the normal channel to fill it in in the bottom misses um, <laughs> we run our bass all the way off mid pretty much all the way off and treble all the way off it's bonkers um but yeah try that try jumping the two channels 
turn the um, normal channel up to about three, I guess, and then just ease the high treble channel on till it's on. Because if yours has the <laughs> giant bright cap in it that ours has, because we still haven't done the mod, um, it's it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible up until about three or four, yeah. at which point it's overdriving too much. So try that, see how you get on. But yeah, um, you know, hand on heart, I would infinitely prefer a JTM 45 or even better, a 100 watt plexi. But we get some pretty reasonable sounds out yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. like it. Yeah. Um, la 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 la. Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Oh, mate, I've really messed up today. It's okay. Um, Sub Rosa. Hello, Sub Rosa. Mick, do you have any interesting observations now you've had time with the three strats you've acquired this year? Feel and tone, etc. The 70 looks to be getting a lot of play. Um... I am going to make a vlog on this eventually. I haven't. There's I, a lot. There's a lot in there. I can't bring myself to start it because it's like, where on earth do you start? But what I would say is that let's take the 61 and the 70. I think they're archetypally quite representative of the of the respective eras. Right. For whatever experience I have in that, the 61 is is perfect. It is just astonishing it just sounds mega i don't want to put a tone control on the bridge pickup it's all there i even like the mid pickup yeah middle pickup it's just um a couple of annoyances the switch is really stiff so i just need to get that sorted somehow because it's you know original um and there's some setup stuff that needs to be done it does need a new nut um and there's a couple of other little things that i need to do just to get it perfect but that's the guitar i play more than any other i've been playing the 70 on the show just because it's a bonkers guitar yeah it's amazing it's so resonant mm. uh, might be because it's got huge strings massive action and tuned to e flat but it has this thing and it definitely has the sort of post mid 60s sound to it which is quite different from the 61 um the the custom shop shows itself to be a fantastic guitar when you play it alongside those others yeah. and you don't feel sad about it. Sure. I love playing that guitar. Last that's the one I, you took to the gig. Yeah, this, yeah. I, that's the one I took and it, well, it was partly out of safety, but um, uh, it's it's a really fantastic guitar. And I'm really sorry to say it. They do, they all three of them knock blue into, uh, you know, a hedge, a lesser place. And I'm very sad about that. And actually, I'm not sad about it at all. I, I know that lots of people who watch TPS are... You it, can sell yourself with your 61 Strat <laughs> playing your, your, your... But a lot of people are sort of invested in, blues, in, that, blue blues. in that guitar because they watch the show and, you know, you... you... Uh, they're really nice blue Strat. <laughs> <laughs> now I play the 61. And I don't... I don't just think it's motivated com um, cognition either. I think... I've always known that that blue guitar isn't the ultimate strat and that's what I've been searching for. So I've ended up in this ridiculous place and uh, I feel semi vindicated in that, that I wasn't just grasping at straws. I, I did know that something better was out there and, um, or should I say better for me? Cause there's a few people that have played the 61 and like, I do not get this at all. And that is totally cool. Cause that's what it's all about. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I love them. Um, I'm fighting with whether to leave the 70 in E flat and uh oh wow and have it as that but that makes it kind of not usable in a normal normal yeah. life. What I would love to do is persuade every band I play into to tune to 432 and play there cuz put blue in E flat. It just suits it. <sighs> oh, you know, whatever. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yes, a vlog, a vlog's on the way because it's a really, it's a really yeah. big question. You what, can see already see how much there is. What I think is useful for for me and for you lot is 
all this crap I've been talking about over the years about, you know, I think that the archetypal rosewood board strat sound is this and it changed in the mid 60s and it ended up as this. I think we can now demonstrate that right. to a point. Yeah, they weren't all the same. They did all differ. But I do think those guitars in particular are good archetypes yep. of their respective periods. So Lovely. um I put it this way. I am no less interested in strats at this point. <laughs> and I keep learning stuff every week. So I'll try and share as much of that as I as I can. Thank you for asking. Um, Reeves Electro Guitar Pedals. Marcus. Oh, Marcus, on, Marcus you've been ridiculously generous, mate. Thank you for that. You didn't need to do that. Um, he says, just to say thanks for the revelations at the guitar show. Mix, here's what it sounds like with a TS and Dan's vibrato sound in a wet dry left me doubting everything I thought I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you, mate. Oh, thank you, buddy. Take that show on the road, he says. So we've been, um, we did mention this last time we did a, a live thing. And I think it's worth exploring that idea of going to the States. Yeah. And because it'd be, I mean, A, it would be so much fun. We do a thing called Experience Days at the moment. We've got one coming up this Friday. And where we have a bunch of people come in and we take them through TPS and what we do and they get to stand in the room and, and hear what it's like with the amps on full. And to a person, it's always been wow moments and uh, light bulbs yeah, going Oh off. my God, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing as as, as, as you've said, Marcus, that it's a, we... Mick does the most amazing job with the audio of getting that experience across, but unless you're in the room with it, yeah, you know, and so and you that thing right with the vibrato and it just it wraps me yeah. and I'm gone, yeah. you know, and that's what it's all about. So yeah, I think we should explore that a bit more though. Yes, it's um, I'd love to do more live stuff. Yeah, really would, really would. We well, yeah. do have some gigs, some gigs coming up. We do. Yeah. Uh, we're sold out on the Saturday night in Whitney, so that, that's done, unfortunately. But there are still tickets. If you go to that pedal show store and look up for events, and there are some left for Sunday in Whitney, and there are some left for Froome. Uh, and this is the 23rd, 25th, and 26th yeah. of June. June. Yes, indeed. With Andy Timmons. With if, Andy Just Timmons. in case we didn't mention that. <laughs> Soren led it. Hello, Soren. Hey, Soren. Nice to hear from you. He says, hey, gents. Amazing and inspiring show on Friday. I put the page boost back on my board before my clon. I couldn't resist. There you go. Man. Boom. So good. Chris Groom. Chris, um, unbelievable generosity. Thank you, mate. That's super kind of you. He says, hi, Mick. Hi, Dan. Great vid on Friday. New amp day. Victory V4 the Sheriff pedal. Oh, oh nice. nice. Cool, man. Well done. Lovely. Uh, I'm not sure what the latest iteration of it is. It, is it the one that's got the um, two notes stuff in it? I think they've... Oh, have they done that? They've done that on most of the V4 series Oh, lovely. Now. Okay. Um, if, you know, if you have a call for that. I remember the, the original V4 Sheriff pedal was really killer as well. So yeah. Whatever it is, I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Um, if you don't know, Martin at Victory did a really clever thing with the way the signal is routed. So you can basically do the four cable method um, from the pedal itself. Yeah. If you've got an amp with an effects loop, it gives you another channel to your amplifier. Yeah. And it's so clever. But what, what most four cable method solutions don't really give you the opportunity to do unless you have another switcher is switch the preamp of your amp off. Yeah. Or indeed out yeah so you can go from let's say you have a deluxe reverb actually you can't do it with the deluxe reverb because there's no effects loop let's say you have any amp you want to think of with an effects loop you can say here's my amps preamp oh no now i want the victory v4 and you can literally replace it with the victory v4 mm. it's a really cool thing and it happens all in the pedal you don't need external that was your idea wasn't it cobblers oh uh, well it was part of my that idea. was your idea no yeah, I don't, you can just take a bell I it's don't, a brilliant no, idea i don't think it was entirely my idea okay i'm gonna say it was mick's yeah. idea yeah there's no i in team done <laughs> but there isn't it's my idea <laughs> um paul matunovich evening pod eye he says pod eye that must pod be eye. some latin for uh, feet i guess pod, pod yeah yeah okay yeah. Uh, jamming out on the Zenray from Pogo Pedals, formerly Scotty of Pro Analog. 
the devices. Oh, cool. And it made me wonder. I know you gripe about D-Star pedals um, for their spurious claims, but do you actually like how they sound? The, so here's the problem. I really like the HRM by um, uh, J-Rocket. J-Rocket. And the Dude. I love both of those pedals. Yeah, they're, they're, they're great. But do they sound like Dumbles? Well, no. There you go. So calling it a D-Star pedal, I think, I don't know, stood in front of uh, Joe's Dumbles the other day, Joe Bonamassa's Dumbles. It's like, never had a pedal that sounds like that. No. You know. No, because by saying the Dumble sound, oh, God, who are we talking about? Are we talking about... Robin Ford in 1987, or are we talking about Robin Ford last week? Yeah. Are we talking about Larry? Are we talking about, um, I don't know, Christopher Cross's guitarist or Christopher yeah. Cross himself? Are we talking about, who, who, who am I thinking of? Uh, David. Linley. David Linley. Are we talking about, you know, who are we talking about? Because they are vastly different. And I think what we're talking about with Dumble is the kind of compressed version of what everyone thinks an overdrive special sounds like yeah and uh, i don't know it's just so hard because if you're stood in front of one and you're hearing it it's nothing like you know once it's been put on talk to your daughter which is a very different thing mm. So yeah, that's if we gripe about it, it's that. It's like I don't really know what the sound is in the first place to be able to. But it's not just that, right? It's not just about the D stuff thing. It's about anyone that says this is an amp in a box yeah. type thing. And that's and yet obviously there are some that have a Marshall band and some that have more of a tweed thing, and that's really great. But saying that this is a this is a, an actual this is sounds like an actual Dumble or this sounds like a JTM forty five, you know, it's like. Does it though? What JTM forty five? How you know? Anyway. Yeah, and of course, once it's recorded and you're hearing it on YouTube or on a record, then sure, I think there's probably a bit more to talk about there. But actually, stood in front of it, unless you've got a cranking six L six power stage and some EVs. Yeah. It's never going to be anything like a Dumble at all. Yeah. Scott Gallagher brings up a good point. Says each Dumble is so unique. I don't think you can catch it in a single pedal. That's very true. Yeah, and yeah. each player. Anyway, sorry, Paul, if that's a bit grumpy. Um, we haven't actually heard Scotty's new pedals. I don't know. They Forgive me if I am wrong. They look to be fairly standard. I don't know. I have to... Far Eastern fare. Okay, I don't know. I don't know. We should, we should check them out. So apologies uh, if I've got that wrong. Mel Hackinson. Hello, Mel. Mick, what capacitor value do you put in your strats? Mine have a 0.047 and it sounds darker. Yes, if you went from a 0 0.047 from a 0 0.022, I mean, theoretically, it shouldn't make any difference when the pots are all on 10, but they do. It does, because there's, there's, it, because the, it's you're always still connected. going through it. It's yeah. always connected. Yeah. So the, the bigger the number, the further down the frequency spectrum, the point at which it starts to roll off high end. Yes. So that's why um, on the original uh, spec for the cap was 0 0.1 and that meant pretty much as soon as you rolled it off it went really dark because it was rolling it off from way back down the frequency spectrum as the number gets smaller it rolls it off from further up so if you want it to sound less dark there's a few things you can do um try a 0 0.022 or you can get them even smaller than that actually that will help you can also get a no load tone pot I've never felt the need for one, but if you do really like that straight through sound, um, you can get a pot that works as normal right up to the end. And then when you click it, it there's a final detent um, position. Disconnects the tone. Which control disconnects the tone control completely. Yeah. So yeah. that you might find that worth looking at. But yeah, smaller cap. Um, what else? Make sure your pots do actually measure not like 210, which they can do. Mm. Um, there was quite a significant variance in the pots. And I know certainly a bunch of boutique pickup makers and indeed friends of mine who will choose like a 280 for the volume pot rather than... Rather than a 250. 
Yeah. So check all of that. Cool. Check all of that. Um, and if it's just too dark in general, add a buffer. There you go. There you go. Good luck. Um, oh, incidentally, I do have 0.047 in all mine because it's the traditional value and I want it traditional. Sure. Uh, Brian Garcia. Hello, Brian. Hello, Brian. Legs of ends. I'm looking to get a G3 by the end of 22 or maybe early 23. Looking forward to its parallel mixing capabilities. What effects do you both enjoy mixing in parallel? I'm looking forward to having a chorus in parallel with a flanger. Yeah, great. And you have them set at different times. Dan's going to love that. Oh, man. Yeah, it's, it's really fun. So one of the things that you'll like about it is that not only can you mix them in parallel when you join them back up, but then you can flip the phase as well, which is, you know, when you're mixing things in parallel, it's really important to, that you can do that. So that's a lot of fun. For me, I love vibrato on one side, clean on the other. I think because I love my Dharma vibrato pedal so much, um, but when you hear it on its own and it has that angular waveform to it and the movement, it just, it evokes something. And you hear that in the conjunction with the direct signal, it's like, oh, it just sounds massive. So, yeah, that's my favorite thing. But also, I will say, running different gain stages in parallel. So having yeah, a really, it's a really great thing, like a really nice... Um, so yeah, one thing I do, I have a treble booster going into my page um, boost and on the other side I'll have the DNM drive and I'll mix those two together. And it's like, what's amazing with that is what happens when you start doing this. Yeah, yeah. Ah, it's just, yeah, fun. Parallel's fun. It is fun. It's also a nice, if, you, um, if you're a fan of using two delays but you don't yeah, want them to yeah. necessarily affect one another. It's a great way of splitting the delays. So you might want an analog slapback and something else. To be fair, slapback doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but can be a great way of mixing two delays. Um, as you say, two separate modulations on the two parallel lines is probably the most fun, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great fun, great yeah. fun. Oh, cheers, mate. Well, yeah, have fun with that. Good luck, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Paul Matulovic again. Hey, Paul. Hey, Paul. Uh, we're going to be seeing you at an experience day. Yes. Looking forward to that. He says, hey, gents, what are your pick plectrum choices these days? Dimension, grip, etc." Mick put me onto these picks years ago, and I've tried them against everything, and now I can't play anything else. So they are Dunlop Prime Tone 1.5 mil. Standard. Standard. Yeah. And they make this sound. They make this sound. You ready? This is <laughs> but, but they don't sound like that. There's a that high end yeah. cheeky ah oh, it's just yeah. wonderful. Love them. Really love them. They're um expensive enough to be to not <laughs> be not to, lose them. to be on brand. Yeah, they're expensive enough to not want to lose them, but not so expensive that you don't want to take them out. Sure. I've never got into the um, boutique pick thing. Have you done that? No. I like, tried. Remember when we were at the guitar show in Copenhagen and you bought me a few things and a couple of stone picks? Yeah. And they were really great, but my issue is that's a one-off. Yeah. And if I, if, I, if I develop my playing around the pick and I lose it, I'm stuffed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what we're using, Paul. Uh, Dunlop Prime Tone 1.5 Standard. And they're the flat ones, no grip, no nothing, just as they are. David Rutledge. Hey, David. Congratulations are in order for you and the uh, other Rutledge, presumably now. D&M, this weekend was my wedding. Congratulations. Oh, congrats, mate. That's fantastic. My 90s band reunited for the reception. My board rebuilt with TPS. Learning and a QMX8 sounded and played great. Thanks for helping make our big day even better. Oh, mate, that is so cool. <laughs> That's really, yeah, well really done. super cool. Well done. Congrats, congrats. Um, John Parkins. Hello, John. Thank you for your generosity, John. He says, Tippy Toes, my buddy, is a long-time TPS fan and is playing Froome on the 16th of September with his band Brave Rival. Nice. 
so I've bought you tickets. <laughs> if you can't go, then feel free to give them away to TPS folks. Tell tell me where to send them. Oh, that's very kind. It's actually my birthday on the 16th of September. I was thinking that. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think my wife, has, we're doing a joint. She's 50 this year. And we're having a, I didn't get to do my 50th. Oh, you're going to have so a party. Gonna have a, well, I think we might be doing something. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Dad's so having we'll a party. Um, yeah, John, if you if you want to send them to the uh, TPS store address, which you can find on the uh, on the website probably, um, we will either go or we will give them to someone who can go and we will make a charitable donation for the sum total of the tickets so that some oh, good that's very some kind. good is paid yeah, yeah. forward. Thank you for your... Um, I think you'll be busy as well. And Catherine. If, if it's your dog. party. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But we'll we'll find a way. You can't use that gig as an excuse not to come. Sorry, Dan, I'd love to come. I've got to go and see but I've got John's mate at the at the cheese and grain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can have a joint. Maybe we can have a joint thing yeah. at, the, at his gig. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Non-aligned. Hello, non-aligned. Um, a crazy but sincere person offers you £100,000 to play a one-hour gig with only five string on your guitars. Which string do you remove? He says, the worst would be the G string, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I've done those gigs without the high E. Yeah, that would be... The low E would be challenging for me. But uh, yeah, take the high E. I'll take the 100 grand, take the high E off. I'm there all day. Yeah. I think um, tonality and usefulness in the band, the low E is the one that I would need the least. Right. But from a orientation point of view, mm. I think I'd be to totally lost without it there. Sure. Absolutely. Because it's, yeah, it's where your ton all your tonics are. Um... Nevertheless, I'm going to say the low E, and then I can just play everything else and pretend it's there. Well, you take the, I'll take the high E, you take the low E off, and we'll be fine. Uh, and I'll be at the end of the gig before you. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, not a line. Thanks for that question. <laughs> yeah, the G string would most surely be the worst. Yeah. Um, Justin Baylog. Hello, hey, Justin. Justin. Rumour has it, Gilmore would always sing or whistle his solos in the studio while he crafted them. The idea being to abstract away from the instrument. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great idea. I used to do this thing when I was studying. I'd get a straw. I'd cut the end off a straw. And I'd chew it down so it was a bit flat. And I would blow as if it was a mouthpiece. And, I would, and I'd only play notes... While I was blowing through the straw, so getting into a habit of, of of going, try you know trying to mimic that, but I had to, yeah, could only I could only play while I was blowing out and had to take breath <laughs> and stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't work, but it Try was to get fun. into the head thereof. Yeah, Robin Ford talks a lot about that, doesn't he? Because his brother's a saxophone player, or was a saxophone player, or is a saxophone player, um, and I think that's he got a lot of his phrasing from from thinking like that right I, I love that idea of abstracting from the instrument a bit like dan was uh, you know once again talk about dan's guitar lesson with tim lurch and having that vocal idea because that's what you want at the end of the well, it's what i want you know when you like sometimes Catherine will be humming along to something in the car and it'll be a guitar solo and i'm like that's a guitar solo there you go if you can sing it there's a guitar solo yep it's great brian may's just well, oh man one of the many masters of that yeah yes nice thank you for that justin uh guitar moog or guitar moog he says salut extremité de jambe from rainy brussels fancy doing a vintage oddity show i just got a 70s ibanez standard fuzz and it's bonkersly nasty and impractically huge mm -hmm. in a really good way mm -hmm. yeah. we, uh, we've got some oddities yeah, happy do. to do that the tps museum of oddities I yeah, like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. That's a great idea. I think also in these times of, um, you know, everyone's a bit worried. I don't want to put a down on it at the moment, but every anyone I know who owns a business is going, man, business is tough. Because, you know, cost of living being rubbish, dare we say the bloody war that's going on in 
Ukraine. Just post COVID, everyone yeah. kind of getting used to what that looks like. Yep, supply chain issues. Supply chain stuff. issues, all that stuff is things. Things are a little tough in a lot of businesses at the moment, and uh, yeah, I think some shows on. Well, here's some old crap we found lying around. Yeah, could be quite. It'd be fun. Enlivening because yeah, yeah, like it doesn't it. require you to spend loads of money. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like it. Great. Let's do it. Um, because we all love old crap, right? Michael Lockyer. Hello, Michael. I'm listening and finalising my deluxe reverb build. Nice. Good on you. That's not without complication. Sure. Yeah. The tank and the valve-driven tremolo. All that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Good wow. on you. Good on you. Hope you like it. Nina Head DJ. Nina Head DJ. Thanks for the show. I think an up-close tour... And stories of both of the pre-CBS Fenders would be a good vid, I'd like to see. Definitely. That. Be a great video. Yeah, would be good. Um, he's, he's talking about in person as well. We'd have to get Big Dave to come and uh, watch the guitars. Indeed. Big Dave. <laughs> Alex241. I'm looking at the Fender Special Edition Telecaster FMT hh which i presume means flame maple top humbucker humbucker mm -hmm. as a les paul replacement is this a mm. guitar a stroke of genius or a heretical abomination um if you go back to the thin lines and the wide range humbuckers designed by seth lover man some of the tones from those those 70s guitars are just astonishing you absolutely can get cracking. I mean, look at the Super Strat, you know. Ah, look. That's great. It's got, oh. a, it's got a wanger on it. Uh, no wanger. Is it? Okay. Pad a wanger. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. So it's mahogany, carved flame maple top. I wonder what the scale length is. Seven. 25 and a half. So it's, yeah, oh, it's... Yeah. Uh, mahogany body, maple top, mahogany neck, uh, over a Fender scale length with dual humbuckers. What a cool guitar. Yeah, lovely. Very nice. Yeah, I mean... Go for if, it. If for whatever reason you don't like, can't get on with, are not a fan of Les Pauls, I would imagine that's going to offer some interesting... Alternatives to that sound. Yeah, really cool. Pickups are... God, I'm so sorry for yawning. Um, 59 neck Pearly Gates Bridge. Oh, you set me off now. Boom. Boom. Awesome. Time for Meat Feast, Dan. Oh, mate. Are we there? Jason Thompson. Greeting stock suffers. Thoughts on playing with others who are obviously light years ahead of you in ability. Thank ah. you guys for what you do. It's the best thing that you can do. Yeah. I promise you, you play with people who are above you in ability and they'll kick your butt and you will learn so much more from doing that than just about anything else that you can do. If you've got the opportunity to do that, man, grab it with two hands. It's the best thing you'll do. And anyone who is a halfway decent human being will always try and help you. I mean... You know, okay, so if I went and did a gig tomorrow with the LSO, that would not be appropriate because I would not know where to begin. I'm clearly not supposed to be there. Right. Or indeed, you know, like some jazz gig because I just, I don't know anything about jazz and I don't even... I think you'd be, I think you'd do surprisingly well. No, I don't know the chords. I don't, I don't know the basic yeah, just, form here's the of key. the music. Swing. You'd be fine. So there, there isn't a... You know, I, I think there's an appropriateness of what you land yourself in. However, if we're talking about like normal bar bands and the kind of things that most of us do most of the time, then as long as they're happy, do what he said. Just learn from them and take it all in. Yeah. Just go in there with that. If you know that these guys are really great, you know, it's a, it's a really good ego check. Mm. You know, and it it's so healthy, that stuff. It's healthy and, 
you know, if you are the person in the band with lesser ability, one would assume you're not going to be playing all the complex parts. So play the simple parts as well as you can possibly play them yeah. and delight in that simplicity Indeed. Of, of doing that. So, yeah, yeah we would absolutely Do it. Have fun, that. go for it. Yeah, and don't ever be da downhearted by it because sometimes you can feel out of your depth and sometimes you can feel bad about that because, you know, you don't have that ability. If you focus on this moment right now, what you're learning right now, what you're playing right now, what's happening right at this moment, and you try not to think about too much else, in two or three years' time, this moment will be an entirely joyous experience for you. Mm. And the amount you will have learned will be massive. But don't spend your life thinking about what you haven't learned and what you are about to learn. It's, yep. it's folly. It's a waste of time. Indeed. Yep. Lovely. Uh, Corey Shoemaker. Hello, Corey. What are your thoughts about the upcoming Spinal Tap 2 movie? <laughs> and the Roman numeral for 2, which also looks like 11, which is one more than 10, which is better in it. <laughs> so those guys have done a bunch of films and they did a film called A Mighty Wind, which I went, well, my wife and I saw on our honeymoon. When so it's about an acoustic, a lot of like a bluegrass band. When I went and saw Spinal Tap live, they were supported by a mighty, a wind, mighty wind, which was them as a mighty wind. I love the way it's a mighty wind, not the mighty, the mighty wind. Yeah, it's a, a mighty wind. Um, I mean, I, I've loved their output, everything from um, oh, they did a show about a dog show and like. Crufts, um, best in show, yeah, 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 yeah. And I just they they are imagine being in the room with them when they're writing that stuff. It, I just I think the world of them, the fact that they did a rock thing, you know, it's just is is icing on the cake. I couldn't be more excited for it, yeah. It's gonna and and you'll you know, it's gonna give us some fresh material, it, it, which would be which would be <laughs> nice. It's uh, it's uh, it's quite the undertaking, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, the fact that it is a cult. Totally. How do you... I mean... I feel like one with a band. There's you no know, <laughs> most blokes are... <laughs> you've made a film and it's become a cult. Where? <laughs> then who's in there? No one. But there's a cult over here. I did think about stalking Christopher Guest, actually, and trying to make sure we were in it. Uh, that would, that would be, that would be it. That would be it. <laughs> I'm done. We're done. We, I'm done now. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you for the constant inspiration, says John Abdullah. Hello, John. Hey, you most welcome, mate. Uh, I'm running a clockwork and hydra at the end of my board into a stereo Princeton wet, and EL. Oh, sorry. At the end of my board in stereo to a Princeton wet and an EL84 amp dry to achieve wet dry stylish whilst getting great stereo effects. What are your thoughts on this approach? If it if it's working, happy totally. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely happy. I mean, you, they are... The sounds that we've got out of those things are amazing. So it's all there. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, just... As usual, be aware of the of the common pitfalls. So just make sure the amps, the two amps are in phase. Um, hopefully, most modern pedals now are in the same phase when you turn them on and off, but some flip the phase. Just be aware of that. Um, and watch your ground loop humps. But if it works and you're enjoying it... Banging. Lovely. Yeah, well done, mate. Lovely. Jason Wade. Hello, Jason. He says with a maniacal laugh... <laughs> I beat off the cut-off switch. No, I didn't beat off anything. I, <laughs> I beat the cut-off switch. <laughs> love you guys and, and BV Ninja. We love BV Ninja too. <laughs> I'm building my first pedal board. Uh, of SP compressor, BB preamp, DNM drive, H9 Max, Source Audio Collider. Would that be right? Anything to add or subtract? No, that's it. That's so... Yeah, what a killer board. It's really killer. I really... So I've got the H9 on my board, and I'm, I'm only using it for the occasional 
thing. But there's a lot of players that really like the sound of it. Yeah. Um, and it does. It sounds it sounds really great. Um, but the collider at the end of that. Yeah, man. If that's your first board, you yep. are you are hitting a high mark. Just one thing to say about the SP compressor, Jason. Um, you don't necessarily have to run it first in chain. It is typical to run one's compressor first. However, that particular compressor has a blend on it, dry blend. So if you're going for the very sort of squashy, funky, country standard um, MXR phase, uh, phase 90, Dynacomp type compressor sounds, then yeah, stick it first by all means. But if you're using it for a bit of dynamic interest, you can try it after at least one of those drive sections with a bit of clean blend in there and it will give you, it will maintain the attack at the front of the note, but give you sustain afterwards. So it's just another way of thinking about the compressor. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, enjoy. Indeed. Victor Gustafsson. Hello, Victor. Hey, Victor. He says, toes. I'm slowly becoming a big board guy, thanks to you. What are your thoughts on having a modular two pedal train nano? Okay. Yeah. Uh, modular two pedal train nano plus setup versus one big board. I love the dual board thing. And yeah, me too. So um, I used to do it with my board when I'd have my standard board with my standard drives, but then for the proggy stuff, I'd also have four fuzzers. Um, on a board with some remote loopies on there and just trigger it by the big board. And it's... Uh, so, being, you know, the modular thing, it's a great way to do it. Yeah. Really great. I'd some I'd have sometimes have, like, the main board, which would have all your food groups on, but quite often... So a certain fuzz, octave fuzz and vibe mm. isn't the kind of things that I'd use every day in a like, normal gig. So I would have the Axis Board of Love that I could just patch in nice. to give me all my Jimmy sounds just on a on a tiny little thing. It's lovely. Yeah, and, that's uh, a great way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, he says this week he's getting a Prince of Tone, nice. a Page V2 and a Squire Blackface this week, or BF, whatever that means. Can't wait. Thanks for a great show. Enjoy. New pedals. Always cool. Man. Uh, yeah. You have so much fun with those. It's great. Alexis Russo. Alexis. Uh, yeah, here we go. Hi, guys. Really great show on Wet Dry, says uh, Alexis. I have a question. Why aren't you using a wetter box to keep your f rig full stereo or summing for one amp? Why aren't we using a wetter box to keep it full stereo? So the wetter box is a parallel blender. And so because... Um, so you... So, right. If we were using just two things, right? If we were using just the delay and the reverb, then we absolutely could do it like that. That would be... We could have those two in parallel. But because we had four things... I needed to use a mixer that had four inputs and then, you know, send them left and right. But if it was just two, if it was just delay and reverb, uh, and then we absolutely could have done it that way. Uh, yeah, and wasn't the mixer doing all of that? Yeah, the mixer anyway. was doing it because we the had... The mixer was doing the job. Yeah, the mixer was doing the same job. Yeah. But only because, because I needed four inputs. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hopefully that explains that, Alexis. Benjamin Hooper, DNM. Love TPS, thank you. I send a program change message from my switcher to adjust my Merus Mercury 7. Yep. Hold Alt button to save, but it always overwrites preset one. Please help. Uh, mate, you need to get contact yeah, yeah, yeah. the guys at, um, at Merus. And they're really good. They've got really good customer support. Or The only thing I would say is make sure that your Merus pedal is getting enough current. Any pedals that you're getting that things aren't working properly, if the pedal isn't getting the current it needs, the first thing that's going to go is a lot of that functionality. So, yeah, make sure that it's being powered properly. 
um, and then just shoot an email off to Meris. That might get you to check your firmware version. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, best of luck with it. That's uh, yeah, that's definitely a, definitely a thing for Meris. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, we couldn't be more help, yeah. Benjamin. Great with, pedal though. Uh, Dan's power thing is a good place to start. Patrick Carroll, hello, Patrick. He says. Will the wonderful women behind the scenes ever be on TPS? Uh, I think I think team would ever. Catherine is absolutely against being on camera of any kind. Yeah, sorry to say. Yeah, um, they might get them in you know cameo roles. On the you know they might accidentally oh who knows yeah um, yeah we have to find a way of doing it. Uh, thanks for asking, Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Ralph Lemon. Hello, Ralph. He says, maybe a bit of a newbie question, but is it possible to hook up two amplifiers to one 16-ohm cabinet from their 8-ohm outputs? Ah. Uh, Running two amps into one cab. Yeah. No. 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 No, you'll, you'll damage things. All, all that you can do... Um, if you want to have two, two amps in a single cabinet, you need something that's going to switch between the amplifiers. But no, you can't. You can't run your amps like that. Yeah. Check out the Ampete Ampete A M P E T E yep. uh, range of cabinet switches or the Switchbone from um, Radial. Radial. Yeah, is a good shout. If if what you mean is you've got say a stereo four by twelve. And it's two separate sides, and you've got two amp heads, and you're going out from each amp into two separate stereo sides of a 4x12. Yes, you can absolutely, absolutely do that. that. That's fine. But not into a mono cabinet. No. no. Uh, Jeff Bonilla, or Bonilla. Jeff, hello. He says, hello, gents, are you coming to NAM? If so, the first round is on me. Ah, oh, bless you. Thank you. Not this time, but we will get out there soon. Yeah, not this time. Um, yes. Have a good one, Jeff, yeah. and thank you for the offer of the drink. Uh, first time caller, long time listener, says Colin Littlejohn. Hello, Colin. Hey, Colin. I'm growing my YouTube channel, and I'm proud to announce I'm playing full time again for the first time since COVID. Oh, wow. And playing for the first time at NAM in a couple of weeks. Oh, wow. There we go. Check out Colin Littlejohn then, people. Colin with two L's. Colin, Colin, uh, Littlejohn. Excellent. Yeah. Well done, mate. Congratulations. It's a big step. Well done for getting back in the game. Yeah, yeah, but brilliant. Well done. It's uh, it's a biggest dealus. Right, let's just make sure we are at the end, Daniel. Yes, we are. Excellent. Okay, um, we've gone over a bit tonight. Hopefully you don't mind too much. Uh, let's just make sure that we're okay. We are okay. We are okay. So. It's one of the songs we're doing at the TPS gigs. Thank you so much to BV Ninja for moderating tonight. BV, thank you Legend. so much. Yeah, mate. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone else for being here. Hope it makes you feel good, not bad. Because that's the point of all of this. Indeed. Uh, tomorrow, um, there will be a video on this guitar which has double the number of strings than normal. What is this? What is this? Matt Wishcraft. <laughs> Burn him! Um, and then Friday, don't know what we're doing yet because we're filming it tomorrow. We might have a little rip roaring rip through uh, a bunch of new things that we've been sent. Yeah, let's do something old, something new. Something borrowed, something blue. And you and I can finally talk that night. We can get married. <laughs> I, 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 want, I want to call it, are we still interested in new stuff anyway? Okay. Yeah. I like it's, it. Everything I buy is old now. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for the super chats. Thanks for the comments. Yeah, thanks everyone. Just thank you for being a wonderful group of humans. You really are. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much for staying with us. Right. You know what to do, Dan. Oh. oh, okay. 
Very good. Precious vintage guitar, my bottom. What you need is a 539 pound Ibanez. Um, 